Okay, <laughs> uh, a big welcome to uh, We Are Change Manchester. Uh, it's nice to see a lot of new faces and uh, regular faces. Um, I didn't realise quite how many people would be turning up. We know the logistics of this room aren't perfect, but we'll uh, we'll do our best. Uh, tonight we've got a very special speaker. It's uh, Tony Farrell from uh, Yorkshire. Uh, he used to work for South Yorkshire Police. I won't in, uh, step on his toes by telling him his tail. Just to say he's a very brave man and we want to give him a big Manchester welcome. Okay, thanks Alex and uh, thanks everybody for the welcome and it's great to be in Manchester. Um, just a few things uh, before I start and I want to start with a story. Um, I'm from a place called Witness that uh, is rugby league, but I want to sp I want to start off this with the football. Sheffield really haven't got any football teams of any know at the moment, but we know Manchester have got two and Liverpool have. But South Yorkshire Police have been in a battle with a football team or a family for 22 years. And four weeks ago, I had the privilege of being sat in the House of Commons chambers um, at the Hillsborough hearing, whereby. And my former employers were very much the subject of the discussions 22 years on. And I want to start by telling you a story about Hillsborough in 1989 that occurred to me. On the view there is the Chief Constable of South, former Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police, Mary Lith Hughes. At the Hillsborough 20th Memorial in 2009, when I was still working for South Yorkshire Police as the Principal Intelligence Analyst, I was sat down in the canteen one lunchtime on my own, um, and the press officer of South Yorkshire Police came up to me and said, Tony, can I sit by you? Just, and Andy, join me for lunch. He looked a bit tired. I said, what's up with you, Andy? He says, we've had it in the neck with the press over Hillsborough this morning in front of the Chief Constable. This was on the 20th anniversary of Hillsborough. And uh, I wasn't a football fan, uh, you know, I did support Liverpool as a lad, but I didn't really, Hillsborough as a subject in South Yorkshire Police had never hit my radar. But Andy had been in the ground 20 years earlier, and he told me this story. And I'm going to tell you that story that he told me. He says, Tony, I was there on the day, I was outside the stadium where all the ambulances were, and uh, I was told in no uncertain terms when all hell broke loose in that stadium, when people were getting crushed in the pen at the Leppings Lane end, to make my way to the control room inside the stadium. Now the control room would be manned by the police officers and all the CCTV circuits that would be showing the horror that was unfolding in the pens. So Andy had been given instructions on high to, to make his way to the control room. He got inside the stadium and made his way there. And when he got to the control room, the doors were locked. That means it's Andy from the South Yorkshire Police Press Office could have come in, knowing that his mates, his police officers, would be inside. Can't come in, Andy. No, I need to come in. I've been told from senior ranking officers. You can't come in, Andy. Andy gets back. Bang the door down if you have to, Andy. I want to know what the hell's going on. You need to know and tell us what's going on inside that control room. So ultimately, Andy does get inside the control room. And then he discovers exactly why he can't, he, he wasn't allowed to be inside that control room in the first instance and why they were so reluctant. And the reason why they were reluctant to let him in was because it became also evident when he walked in because underneath the control room table, was an assistant chief constable who had actually lost it. He was a gibbering wreck underneath the table. And Andy had realised that the police officers were trying to protect the assistant chief constable. And he was telling me this. Now at the time, I wasn't really attuned to the plight of the families over Hillsborough. And it really washed over me. I remember saying to Andy, uh, there but for the grace of God go I, I wouldn't know what I would have done if I'd have been in control of the control room that day. Could I have coped <coughs> with the horror where 96 people were crushed to death and there were many, many more injuries? Now, I soon got distracted and I, I soon forgot about that as I returned to my work that I was doing that afternoon. I never really gave it much thought until about 
two, two months ago. When a, a guy called David Pitcock from Sheffield brings me up and says, your chief constable, or former chief constable, is getting it in the neck over Hillsborough again, I see. And of course, I couldn't resist, but Google search, why? And it led me to the Liverpool Echo and the Hillsborough Family Justice Campaign that were talking about all the disclosure issues over Hillsborough. And it sh I watched the video of Margaret Aspinall, head of family, Hillsborough Family Support Group, address the Liverpool Stadium 20, at the 20th anniversary, saying that the reason why we can't let this go is because we know we've never had the truth from South Yorkshire Police. We know we've never had the truth. We've been demonised by the press. You know, and that still sticks with us to this very day. I recall then a story that Andy told me. And I thought to myself, yes, that story could never ever have been disclosed. It's inconceivable that that story was disclosed because that assistant chief constable who on that day had lost the plot for whatever reason was still in command when I joined the force in 93, four years after Hillsborough, and retired on a great packet, his reputation totally unblemished in 1995. His subordinate officer, a chief superintendent, Duckenfield, was the one who actually copped for all the blame. But not a murmur. Not a murmur in any of the disclosure about what happened in that control room that day that was filled, manned by police officers and a senior ranking officer. And on the 20th anniversary, you can Google Meredith Hughes talking about how we are a different force to the force we were in 1989. But it's almost inconceivable to me that senior ranking officers wouldn't know the full story of Hillsborough on that day and know that even 22 years later on, the police have still not come clean on the events of the Hillsborough Stadium. And in the chamber, in the chamber, in the House of Commons, I had mixed emotions because they were, the politicians had turned 180 degrees against my old police force. They were all now fully behind the poor families and the injustice that's been done for 22 years. And that the sun got it in the neck. Liverpool family supporters were sort of cleared completely of any, any, any wrongdoing. But it was all really squaring up on my own former police force, South Yorkshire Police. The politicians all gave very good speeches. And it was very emotional. Frank Field, the MP, long standing, said in, in all his time in the House of Commons he'd never known such quality debate as it occurred that evening. It was very emotional. MPs were actually were sitting, standing up, and one or two of them fell over in the, in the chamber. It was that emotional. People were crying. But there was a wind of change, if you believe the rhetoric from the government and the bench, uh, the, the, the bench you know, on both sides of the bench in the Commons, that they were saying how people power through petition can change things. And that even one or two of them were saying that this is an indictment on the criminal justice, criminal justice system uh, that we've let this go, this injustice go along for 22 years. So I'm hopeful for the Liverpool supporters who lost their loved ones that justice will be done. And I'm not a great football fan, and I'm not a great fan for Alex Ferguson, but they talked about Alex Ferguson because he had made a comment which I thought was quite useful. That United have been taunted for what happened in 1958, and we all know, you know, by other supporters. But likewise, Liverpool supporters get taunted for being murderers over the Hillsborough event. And Alex Ferguson was coming out and saying that that chanting, that kind of chanting now, should be treated every bit as much as a racial offence. And I thought, in all the time I've heard Alex Ferguson, that's the best thing he's ever said. I think that... Uh, I, I'm very sad to sort of be a part of that uh, regime that has covered up Hillsborough for 22 years, a denial of the truth. I really wasn't attuned to it though when I was in service. And what I'm going to talk about today is um, a denial of the truth in a very different light. It's a personal issue that I've had 
that really goes very global quite quickly. And I'm going to tell that story, which has got some very interesting features. So I've entitled the talk, Institutional Denial in the Police Service and the Judicial System. Okay. I'll try and structure the talk. We'll get to part three and then we'll decide, we'll, we'll take a break. But just talking about the stand that I took, uh, there comes a time when we all wake up to something and have to actually stand by our conscience. And I think almost, I was just placed in a situation, an incredible situation, whereby all of a sudden I was going to have to go along with a monstrous lie or tell the truth. My conscience wouldn't allow me to sort of keep my job. There's a lot of occult numerology in what's happened with 9-11 and 7-7. And, um, I'm not ashamed to say that I'm a Christian. That's from the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 9 verse 11. And it strikes at the heart of the issue in my, in my way of thinking on a global sense because a common denominator of what I've said is wrong is Freemasonry. <coughs> And the secret passwords for Freemasonry are in those scriptures, Abaddon and Apollyon, and the occult numerology with 9-11. Interesting. We all recognise <coughs> some of those people. There's JFK, Robert Kennedy. Does anybody recognise J. Edgar Hoover? He's the one at the back, far back looking uh, uh, on the left. <coughs> on the left. J. Edgar Hoover. Director of Intelligence, in a way. The individual is confronted with a conspiracy so monstrous he cannot believe it exists. And I think that's the world we're in at the moment, that events like 9-11 and events like in the UK, 7-7, uh, we are as individuals, not talking in this group, we're probably preaching to converted, but out there in our country is a world of people that cannot confront what's out there and wake up and that's a challenge for us but we talk about his famous speech that somehow some believe he got him killed when he spoke out against secret societies and that really strikes at what I believe is the heart of the matter talk about denial for nearly 50 years on and we still think there's a lone gunman or we still have to accept that a lone gunman shot JFK I'm sure people in this uh, don't believe that's the case. Dirty hands, blood on your hands. That's America, imperialistic America over the years. But how quickly that uh, squirm can turn to smile when we've got the bogeyman. We've got 19 hijackers. That was the original story, wasn't it? That they committed 9-11. But you've got all those people involved in an upside down world. The hands. Does it bear resemblance to something? Freemasonic? Although it's hidden. But really they're having a laugh, aren't they? I come from Sheffield. Sheffield, as I say, is not very good at football, but what it does do is it produces steel. And I'm convinced, as is Sheffield Steel Forge Masters, that what brought back down those buildings wasn't kerosene burning steel. So whatever did bring them down, it certainly wasn't that, Jetfield. This guy at the bottom has written ten books. He's been quite influential in, uh, in formulating my early thoughts on 9-11. But also, I put those books on because there is clearly compelling evidence out there. But there's one book in particular that I find quite interesting from that photograph. Does anybody see it? It's the Upside Down book. The Pet Goat. Perhaps better seeing it from that side. George Bush and the Pet Goat. It's quite uh, interesting. The moral of that story is that the little girl has a pet goat who keeps eating all the grass. 
and he's very hungry for the grass. And uh, but ultimately, the pet goat does some uh, fends off a robber. <coughs> right. So although the goat's a bit of a nuisance, ultimately the goat comes good. And the moral of the story is that no matter how Ill, you know, how bad somebody is, they cannot always treat them nicely because they can always come good. But you see that. The problem with George Bush is holding the damn thing upside down, so he tips it on his head. So the moral of the story is to treat everybody with suspicion, right, and, and, and badly. Because one day, they could come back and threaten you. So that's an example, I think. Uh, that's what I find interesting about his little book, which has got some good little connotations. Quickly on to the, just a few things about the 7-7 truth. Again, we've got an upside down world here. We've got four alleged bombers instead of 19. All right? But we've got everything going on. All those faces there play a role in the unfolding events of 7-7. And I'm not going into any great detail on the story. But again, we've got compelling evidence out there that anybody with an open mind, willing to do actual research, cannot fail to come to a conclusion that on balance of probabilities, the government narrative is a pack of lies, just like the 9-11 issue was, and, and, and the commission report was a pack of lies. Tony, Tony Blair, I said on the 2nd of September 2010 that the police service are in danger of uh, nobbling the wrong Tony, and that South Yorkshire police are at risk of making themselves complicit in the act. It didn't make any difference because they, they still nobbled the wrong Tony. They nobbled me instead of Tony Blair. <coughs> but as I say, there's so much information and if anybody has not seen this website, it's a fantastic resource that really tells uh, so much about the stories as to what really happened and calls for an inquest, but it, it falls on deaf ears. All this has to be seen in the context of what the terror threat is. Now, this anybody heard of Contest? The counter-terrorism strategy? The government was one out in, in July 2011, just come out and um, prevent strategy. It's basically looking at how to counteract the terror threat that's going on in the world, and in particular the UK, based on the assumption that the terror threat primarily comes from Al-Qaeda, and to some extent from uh, dissident forces in Northern Ireland. It's an exceptionally good document, well presented in one sense, and it, it, it talks about four things, pursue, prevent, protect, prepare. A, a marvellous strategy to make sure that we're safe. However, in the light of 9-11 and 7-7, I take that, I take that strategy on its head whereby the government, I wouldn't call it contest strategy, it's more like a contempt strategy, where pursue is persecute the Muslims, prevent is pretend it's the Muslims, protect is to petrify us, and prepare it's to plunder their oil. Right. That's me talking freely now. That was not the kind of thing I would say immediately to my managers that got me the sack. But in the context of what's happening in the world, that rhetoric, that government rhetoric, is insipid to me. And that that is far more realistic, in my opinion. Rich picture. I put that in because it features later on. But again, so many uh, things uh, are described in a pyramidical, you know, a pyramid system. Well, rich picture is all about getting information, but targeting essentially Muslim communities. On the basis of what? The lies of 9-11 and 7-7. Threat levels. This is the dumbing down that we've uh, got into. Because for long enough now, we've got five threat levels. And most of the time, the government would have us believe that the threat level has been severe. Occasionally, occasionally it just drops down to substantial. Right. But that is given to the public to heighten their fear without any intelligence to substantiate it. And over time, the history of the threat level, as dumb as it is, has been that. <coughs> That's it. 
So at the moment you see that our threat level has just dropped a little bit from severe in September 2010, which is about the time I would have been sacked, to July 2011 would have actually lowered the threat level. So the stand, as far as I'm concerned, I have to sort of, uh, I lost my job because of what I believe the multiple terror threat. And under the counter-terrorism domain of the force control strategy, that was my job to produce one, the government position, as far as I was told, was that the main strategic threat from Al was coming from Al-Qaeda or Islamic extremism. But once it dawned on me that 9-11 and 7-7 were inside jobs, and I asked my boss, give me some evidence to set to, to prove that it's Al-Qaeda, he says, I can't. So, I very much, almost instantly, <laughs> on my head, sort of said, well, the main threat is from internal police state tyranny. So, <coughs> I wanted to make a stand. My principles were that, right, they went for a mantra, South Yorkshire Police, which uh, sounded quite good, doesn't it? Justice with courage. I like that when I join. Police staff standards for honesty and integrity tell me that I should not give any misleading false documents. Yeah, I saw my role as a principal intelligence analyst, as a purist, to tell the truth, not as a spin doctor, not as an Alistair Campbell. And the requirement of my faith as a Christian was to speak truthfully and not bear false witness against my neighbour. It's the ninth commandment. Where the, you know, and, and a lot of religions, faith, hold to that commandment too. So the stand, how could I possibly permit myself to say in a report that the threat came from Islamic extremism when my own analysis told me, albeit from open source information, that it came from internal police state tyranny. How could I possibly knowingly frame the innocent? This was the things that were going through my mind as I, I, I came to sort of the deadline. And how could I as a Christian knowingly wrongfully point the finger at Muslims? <coughs> and it was, to my mind, a rich picture that was being of an ignoble lie and I wanted nothing to do with the I caught, they said, enabling the one truth. That was a slogan that actually came out in the month in South Yorkshire Police. And I looked at that slogan, enabling the one truth, what does that mean? And I asked my performance manager that same question. What does enabling the one truth mean? And basically the answer it got stunned me. If we, it came from senior managers in the police force, in South Yorkshire Police. And it basically, if they say it's true, there is to be no dissent. We don't want people, people going off at a tangent saying that this is the truth. <coughs> so what they say goes, no dissent. That sent Duda down my back. As a principal intelligence analyst, I knew at that point that I was on a collision course at some stage with my employers. The role of an intelligence analyst really was to, um, guided by the national intelligence model, assure that the processes for tasking and coordinating conduct the strategic threat assessment and that was fed into the UK threat assessment and that all informed what we call the control, note the word control, strategy within the police force and I uh, was looking at strategic analysis to do that. It covered a multitude of sins, um, you know, an exciting job actually, you know, you got to do charts like that, I was sure that just uh, talks about the Bush Empire. Now, not that I produced that, but that wouldn't be a, an untypical type of chart that an analyst would have the computer software to produce based on the intelligence. Um, now, it might be on a criminal network, and a, a, a drug dealing network in South Yorkshire, and we produce a chart like that. But that chart's very interesting because it tells you a lot about George Bush and his family over two world wars. But we go back to when I made my stance. It was on the 6th of July 2010, Houston, we have a problem. So I was nervous, I was emotional. When I realized that I had to make a stance, I gave them what was a bit of a red alert and said, look, there's a problem out here. People in the country are beginning to wake up to the lies of 9-11 and people will start to, they're certainly doing it waking up in America and they will wake up in the United Kingdom and when they do, that is going to be a recipe for disaster and that there will be widespread distrust with the population against the government. So I was going about this tentatively and by the way I said I happen to believe that 9-11 and 7-7 were inside jobs and in two days time you're expecting me to say that the threat of Islamic terrorism. I said, 
show me. And if you can't show me. But they just wanted me to go to occupational health for doing that and also get on with the job and ignore what I was telling them. So they just says, don't rock the boat, Tony. We're just the government foot soldiers. Right. So for a day, which happened to be the fifth anniversary of July uh, of the London bombings, the 7th of July 2010, they wrapped me up in cotton socks. They looked at all my work to make sure I'd done it. And I had. And I'd done it as if, you know, when I genuinely believed that it was the Islamic terrorism, I scored the model up accordingly until it dawned on me that that wasn't the case. So they realised I was in a position to deliver. So on the 8th of July, I was about to deliver to the board meeting my wonderful models that they loved. So, but on the evening of the 7th, wavering in the wind, I agreed. I went, I went along, they agreed to make an occupational health appointment with them. I agreed to set aside my main anal analysis and uh, go along with them. And I agreed not to rock the boat. But I only agreed that for one day. Because in the evening, I came to my senses. And uh, yes, compelling scripture crossed my path, but I realised that I can't tell a lie. So the next morning, I got... The next morning, I go in, in a one-to-one -one meeting with my director of intelligence analyst. And I get in early and make a ludicrous score of the front of the strategic threat matrix. So I put some stupid figures in. And I shove this figure in front of him at 7 o'clock in the morning saying, Boss, there it is. He looks at it, he says, what's this? He says, it's all I can give you because you're not letting me tell the truth. At that point, basically, all my privilege were withdrawn and I was asked to go home and write a report to explain why I felt so compelled to make the stance. He didn't want the analysis, he just wanted me to explain why I felt so strongly about this. That was a strategic threat assessment from Matrix, and uh, I'll zoom in a little bit because you see, uh, my first degree is applied statistics, so uh, I can add up, but you see that I clearly can't on that. So I'm, give, I'm putting some absolutely daft scores in front of his face. Uh, but basically, we're assessing again, we're assessing the harm from various cr crime and criminality and scoring it up in some probabilistic model. It's daft, it doesn't make sense, but the government are asking you to do this thing. And it's a dumbing down of intelligence analysis. You know, and it's a distraction. And it's there to justify the resources that are given to special branch to put out the contest strategy, the rich picture, to get you frightened about the threat level. That was my honest assessment. So I was throwing back to them what was a ludicrous looking threat assessment matrix. It then subsequently led to what would have been a front sheet of a control strategy where all of those, under all those domains, there'd be subjects like burglary, vehicle crime, drug dealing, but also you see what I've just gone and done and put everything as irrelevant and just said the truth about 7-7, the truth about 9-11, and shoved that in front of his head. <laughs> he said, what's this? As I said, look, it's all you can get. It's either the whole truth or you get nothing. So clearly, it wasn't going to change my mind, but then obviously I am now off the premises, writing a report, and the report I entitled A Rich Picture of an Ignoble Lie or an Enabling the Wrong One Truth. So I'm now echoing back the one truth back to them. You know, and it's arising because basically I hold views which are unconscious to the UK government's rhetoric on 9 11 and 7 7. Um, but it also considers the New World Order and a few other things thrown in. It's a self-analysis, but the, the, the interesting point is I make five inferences uh, and put a probability assessment against those inferences. So the first inference I put, it says 9-11 was a false flag operation, right? I put the probability assessment as 0.99. That's basically 99% certain that it was. 7-7 was an inside job, 95% certain that it was, right? Right, the uh, American government lies uh, <coughs> You know, and have been used as a pretext for war in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? And it's an immoral war. And I put the probability assessment against all of these things. I then go into a few other things, such as the New World Order and the satanic ideology. This isn't normal stuff. I have never mentioned any of this before. But I feel so outraged that, you know, I have to explain myself, this is how they get it. 
and I explain myself from what this means to me. So from my role as a principal and I'm required to tell the truth, right? I'm a purist. You know, the strategic threat assessments are supposed to be honest, right? So too is the force control strategy. The ethics of the organisation seem to be diverging away from my personal ethics, right? And if they want me to go to the occupational health and I say the rapist, therapist, then they can get lost because there's nothing wrong with me. So I'm coming out really quite sort of angry at this stage because they've cornered me and wanted me to go to occupational health and tell them the truth. Right? So I end up this I end this report, right? Make a plea to them to do something about this. Their own mantra, when I first joined, that only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, was something the Chief Constable used way back in 1995 and was reflecting him back at them. For heaven's sake, do something about this police force. Because there's corruption in high places within the police service and the intelligence service and in the government. Unusually, this is the first bit of scripture I'd ever used, and the first time anybody would have known that it really was religious. But so appalled with the evil that was it, you know, around with 9-11 and 7-7 that I actually used Ephesians 6 as the, the parting shot of this summary report. And I included loads of appendices. So Ephesians 6, this was already something I had on top from a talk I'd done two years ago to a, a, a Christian audience about my faith and my workplace. So I had this and I, I showed them these slides as an appendices. Right, to do with that particular part of scripture that talks about good and evil. I also show them these appendices to give them insight that look, there's more to it. There is a satanic ideology that's underpinning all of this and it runs from within. It runs within our own, it seems to be manifesting itself within our own counter-terrorism strategy. And I use this slide to it to show them because the double standards, because Philip Lane, whatever his name was, did a silly act in his drunken stupor and urinated on a memorial about this time last year, about two years ago, and got pilloried by the press. And South Yorkshire police got pats on the back for arresting him. But to my point was the real villain of the piece, they wouldn't dare arrest but he's the one that should be arrested. That guy was very remorseful for what he did. Have we ever heard a word of remorse from Pony Blair for the thousands upon thousands of people that he sent to death in Afghanistan and Iraq? So basically I was sidelined then. I was, uh, I was on my own and um, went on gardening leave and then turned up at a he appeal hearing, a, a, a disciplinary hearing. So, at this stage, there's no disciplinary action to take against me. I'm on gardening leave, but I'm told to come on the 2nd of September to a hearing with which a case I could be dismissed. They asked me, could I change my views on it? And I said I couldn't retract. So ultimately, they sacked me for saying that you've done some excellent work for South Yorkshire Police, your beliefs could be correct, your views are genuinely and honestly held, it's a sad day for South Yorkshire Police, but your views and your beliefs are incompatible. So it is with regret that we have to sack you. And then add a, a few days to put into an employment tribunal. So basically, you've got the mapping out. I had an appeal hearing th ex a year today at South Yorkshire Police Authority. Then it went into a pre-hearing review in the employment tribunal in May. That was to discuss my beliefs. I mean, philosophical beliefs, and then a final employment tribunal on the 7th, 8th and 9th of September. Uh, now, these are very interesting things uh, that happened, but I'm going to just give you a f an insight into just what my beliefs and my analysis was in context. Right. Now, I was a tried and trusted principal intelligence analyst that had been around for some time, so it wasn't as if it was the new kid on the block just creating waves. I'd never created waves, and I was reasonably well qualified. And up until a week before my assignment was due, I'd never once doubted the official version, so this came at me thick and fast. I, I had developed interest in the Dax of end time Bible prophecy, and I was looking at the church history, and I was, it got me onto the New Age, Freemasonry, uh, and it was from that angle that I came at it. 
and it was then that it dropped on 9 11. And then, so clearly, when 9 11 was apparent, it just struck me as that this is just an example of the new world order at work, an atrocious example, and likewise 7 7. But basically, you know, at first I wasn't that knowledgeable of 9 11, but I knew enough already just from, the, just from, from a week's work on it to convince me that it was pointing towards an insult. It's not rocket science, is it? You just have to be open minded. Right. So there were, there were the source documents that really led me early on. And likewise with 7 7, you know, there were some good documentaries that I watched and a bit of reading, Home Office report read. Lo and behold, it stinks. And later on, there's more information about Lady Justice Hallett's inquiry, the, the hearing, and a lot more uh, miscarriages of justice, justices that happened. You know, some analysis, and I'll, I'll race through these because that's Ian Crane, early doors, spotting the similarities between 9 11 and 7 7. You're not meant to read all those. That's Dr. Rory Riddle Duff from Sheffield, who'd done a paper on comparing Moad Dibb's 7 7 ripple effect against the BBC conspiracy files, which was trying to defend the government narrative, and came to the conclusion that the evidence, the more plausible story, was by far and away the uh, Moad Dibb's ripple effect was a more coherent one than the government story, right? Which I thought was interesting. But, you know, we get, uh, you know, people. You know, there's Moad Dib, who's been, uh, you know, instrumental in the truth movement, his ripple effect, probably more, more than any other, has caused a stir within the government over the the story on nine and on seven seven. Right. Now that's what 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 what's Rory Ridley Duff's work about? Well, all the. Uh, what happened at Canary Wharf was quite interesting, and some people perhaps don't attach much importance to this, but there was a lock-in at HSBC at Canary Wharf shortly after the bombings went off, and reports went... There were 19 reports in total that said uh, that indicated um, there were problems at Canary Wharf. Some were indicating that there had been assassinations. Uh, some that yeah, obviously were telling that people had to keep away from the windows. So. And that went wild um, to some degree and was reported across the globe. But then there were 19 reports that he referred to. Right? Now, do we ever mention that in the government narrative? It's brushed aside as if it didn't matter. What happened at Canary Wharf, whatever, it, you know, it, it, it's denied. Nothing happened of any note, we're told. But Moad's story and hypothesis would put the, at least two of the bombers there because they could not have been on the trains. I'm just going to race through this because those that, I'm sure most of you will be aware of a lot of the issues on 7-7. Uh, but if you look out there, there's so much stuff that um, shows problems. You know, that Jaguar car on the, uh, the, the right-hand side is something that the government have ignored, yet was there on both occasions, for the 28th when the so, few of the bombers were down there, and on the 7th. And that Jaguar car turns round and actually leads up to the vehicles where the four alleged bombers are supposed to be. But at that point in time, how convenient, the CCTV cuts out. So you don't see that, intera that interaction. But there's never any investigation into who that Jaguar car belonged to. It's some kind of controller, potentially. I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but those that haven't seen this, you know, this came from Lady Justice Hallis inquiry, and any evaluation of what was around points towards the opposite to what the government is saying, and that it's almost in, it, inconceivable that the terrorists, the alleged terrorists, were on these trains. Now I'm not going to go into the, uh, all the details why, because the, 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 you could go on for, for several hours with this, but I want to show you the, these are the kind of exhibits that are there. The profiles of these bombers are not in keeping with your normal terrorists. Right. There's things like body counts that were taken at the time that don't add up, and they have to actually have the bombers blown to smithereens because they weren't counted originally. You know, in order to fit the story, right? It was simply not your typical terrorist, 
and I, I, again, I don't really want to go into all the details, but uh, people can, can look at this and with a critical eye see that there is far from having scant information, there's compelling information that proves that the government are t telling a pack of lies on all counts. And that is a conspiracy, a conspiracy to hide it up. So all this is, is readily available and, you know, part of my analysis that I could have offered. Um, Moadib has spent 151 days in prison. Why? Because he stood for the truth. He sent the DVDs to the Kingston trial and the judge, who was actually <coughs> assuming or, or saying to the ju ju jury that you do know that the four bombers were responsible. Well, they've never been proven in a court of law. So Moab did made a stance and subsequently led to his imprisonment that coincided, how conveniently, with the duration of the Lady Justice Hallett's inquiry. They didn't want somebody as dangerous as Moab did around at the time when the hearing was being presented. But the feature of the hearing was that there was no critical questions ever allowed or asked. Everything was presented as unvarnished truth. And close look, we don't think what you don't expect anything from it. But there are many other injustices that have happened to the Muslims. These people were subsequently tried twice, but a jury was able to record a verdict that went against the judge's recommendation, so they were cleared. We all are aware of that to some degree, and the assassination that occurred a couple of weeks later on the underground. And I was in court when they asked me about incidences, when I was under cross-examination, as to what I thought about 21st of July, I said, well, what about the 22nd of July and John the Menzies, Charles John the Menzies. So if you ask me about 21st, let's talk about that. The judge shut me up. He says, we have to take that as an unfortunate accident. No further conversation. So they can ask me and make, try and make me look ridiculous, but if I was to say something like that in court, they shut me up completely. Other possible areas, you know, that we, you know, David Kelly, he was a whistleblower, wasn't he? And then died. This guy in Islamic, this guy, Osama bin London, as he jokingly calls himself, he's a family man, he, he, he gets asked to go paintballing with the BBC, and because he knows a few people, he's bound to write as a terrorist. It's appalling what's going on. This guy, I'm absolutely convinced, He's innocent, and his family are lovely, and he's a nice guy. And this is the this is what we're into at the moment. It's disgusting. Another person that kicked the bucket. Now I'm not saying that he was not old. What I do put is a probability. It says consider the possibility that he is, because you can put probability assessment on these. You could even put a probability assessment on that. But I won't go into all the details. I don't put a high one on it but consider the possibility. Those in Manchester probably know who that person is. Colin Todd, former Chief Constable. So there are so many reasons why I can't believe the government on 7-7 and they're not meant to be read, but what I do want to show you is a little bit of the templates because the way I would deal with this as an analyst, Jack Straw, Tony Blair, said this is all the hallmarks of Al-Qaeda as soon as it happened. They're on record the same way. Well, sorry, this has all the hallmarks of being an inside job. And what I did there is you've got an issue and premises that support that issue and a scoring system where in those right-hand columns I score it on a Likert scale where actually that fact, rather than support the government narrative, supports the theory of an inside job. Right? And I score it on a grade of 1 to 5, a Likert scale, and work through this systematically. So, the existence of mock terror drill exercises, for those that don't know, Peter Power ran a terror, terror drill that somehow morphed into the real thing at the exact same locations at the same time. Now, the statistical problem is that, I mean, by pure chance, we've all got a better chance of going on the moon for the party and getting back. It's that daft, right? So, it lends support, and I've put it top marks, for it being an inside job. It doesn't prove it, but it lends support. And cumulatively, I've got at least 14 
templates like this, I've got, I won't show you everyone, where I've scored them all through. So highly probable coincidences, a shifting story of Peter Power, the fact that there's been no state investigation, you know, phantom terror events, you know, go on to the next page, draconian measures and perverting the course of justice that have been brought in, so closed secret practices, no public inquiry by Prime Minister Blair, right? No independent public inquiry, no post-mortems of the 52 or the 56. Right. The rights of family witnesses denied, diversionary terms of reference by Lady Justice Hallahiri. Right. Other related miscarriages of justice. You know, you can put all these on your slides, on, on your shirt, you know, on the video, I won't go through them all. But just to give you an idea, just number 30 bus at Tavistock Square. All the scores down the right hand side. Now, I'm sorry, the straightforward answer is there are just too many clues that it's an inside job. Statistically speaking, it's a dead cert. How it can be when there's so too many clues that people are deliberately heading the sand or blind to it is, is outrageous. And those backbenchers who were in Hillsborough talking about the truth four weeks ago I've got a shot because they all know about this because they all know from a witness statement that I put in on Hillsborough that I was also saying there was an inside job. So they don't, and they're not aware and alert to the possibility of London bombing being an inside job by now. And if they were worth their salt, they'd look at it and we'd have, we'd have politicians speaking about it. The only politician I know of who's spoken about this is Michael Meacher, 9 11. He doesn't speak about it anymore. They've got to him. I think it was Ian Crane who spoke to him and says, Michael, why don't you actually say any more about 9 11? He says, Ian, you don't know how powerful these people are. So, what was once a brave politician no longer is brave. He's been bought off in some way, shape, or form. So, he doesn't speak about it. Again, Canary Wharf. And I could go on and on. I've done at least sort of 14 pages of analysis that I will be presenting to court to prove to the judge why my beliefs weren't absurd. And why they should have looked at my data analysis under a disclosure. So again, there are just too many clues. What are the reactions? Right. Basically, I call it institutional denial. And condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. But all along now, from now on, through the courts, I get blocked with institutional denial of what's going on. I can't get anywhere with it. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that story. And from a number of perspectives here, what have people thought about doing this, including the people inside the police, how they've treated me, the judicial system, my friends, people from the church, Muslim friends, right? The truth movement and the alternative. So a variety of people you know, a bit of analysis as to how they've sort of reacted to all of this. The director of intelligence, he was my boss, he was the one I alerted, right? Nice guy. Yeah. But if, as soon as I just put the flag up, go to occupation home, certi they want to be certified. That was their way of managing me, I'm sure. Right? He just wanted to calm me down. So, you know, nice guy, but a coward, basically. We can't do business like this. He did say something that might be, it could be useful to the police service. Now, I don't know what he meant by that, but I didn't ask him, I wish I did. But really, that was one of the last things I said. But he said, look, you stuck your head above the parapet, the implications are massive, but he sat there. My other manager, he was down there on the drill, on the day. But he couldn't rationalise, he couldn't argue, he was totally close to the possibility, wouldn't consider anything. And basically, you know, he accused me of not being able to engage. But he, this, this DCI, Detective Chief Inspector, was totally close to the possibility. I can't think hypothetically. I can't think like that. Whether that was because he was physically or mentally incapable, or whether because he was part of that story and complicit in it that he couldn't speak, who knows. Two internal case management conferences held in my absence were all about me being mentally ill. Right. They were trying to certify me, and they wanted the all they, they, were, they weren't bothered about my analysis. They wanted me to go to occupational health because that was the way they could, the only way they could deal with me. They couldn't face up to the truth. 
I was asked very early doors for making that stance within a couple of days, would I like to resign? I was told I was going to get the sign. Right? They delayed and denied all that. But that's, all this was amicable. I wasn't falling out with them, but they were telling me I'm doomed. Right? When I did go to occupational hell, the rapist, it was fine. He asked me, what, what if you're wrong? And I said, well, I'm open to persuasion, but the more important question here is, what if I'm right? What if I'm right? And I know I'm right. And I think, if you've looked at it, you'll all know I'm right on 9-11 and 7-7. Even if some of the philosophical side, you might not agree with me. I actually think I'm right on that too, but I'm open to persuasion though. Personnel, I leave that point because nobody from personnel contacted me. They didn't want to know. The senior command team. The guy that sat me in a dismissal hearing is the one in the middle with the glasses. Right? He's a nice guy, Nigel. He wasn't a police officer, he was a director of finance. So he took the dismissal hearing on the 2nd of September. Right? Interestingly, on the 2nd of September, it was all about, my, my word for the day was all about God cares about honesty in the workplace was nice to have that kind of encouragement. Right. I put in some slides, I'm not going to go through with them, right, to do with Abraham Lincoln that featured in a nice synchronistic way uh, with what I've just said about honesty in the workplace and the comments by Abraham Lincoln. However beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. That's a reference to the, contemptible, the, the contest strategy, the counter-terrorism strategy. Might look good on paper, but I'll look at the results of what it's doing to our country what it's doing to our world. Look out the box. In my witness statement, right, Nigel, I say you've sacked the wrong Tony. Yeah, yeah. You could be about to sack the wrong Tony and South Yorkshire Police will indeed then be complicit in counting further perpetuation of that ignoble line. But I put it to them, so sack me if you must then. But each and every one of you involved in this area that uttered a word to, in support of the sacking puts themselves at risk of being complicit in the thousands upon thousands of murders of our innocent brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. I was not pulling any punches. It was all amicable though, you know, despite all of this. It was a sad occasion and uh, a solemn occasion because I, I genuinely believe they didn't really want to sack me. But he didn't have the courage and he sat me, reluctantly almost and it was all very friendly and all very nice when I consulted the legal team because at that point I'd not been to any legal team until I got the sack and they looked at my case today to, this, to that point in September and said you could win it two ways but we don't think you're going to win it he says, basically, you may have a potential discrimination if your beliefs are protected. Those will be your philosophical beliefs, and they'd have to be concerning the New World Order, where I say it's satanic. So that is potentially a philosophical, religious belief, where I can't prove or disprove, but because you've actually put it in the bundle and said it's a threat, actually, you might win on that, because it could be a protected belief. They said you also might win on unfair dismissal, but it's highly unlikely. They only have to prove that they acted reasonably and the threshold is very low of proof. So they weren't optimistic, but they sent me down these two pieces of legislation, the Employment, Religious and Belief Regulations from 2003 and Human Rights Legislation regarding the employment. And I really should have been de redeployed, taken out of harm's way. Um, but when we got to the Appeals Committee, yeah, we had a panel in front of me, uh, including a minor in the, the middle, a uh, red little boy, who um, found my views outlandish and uh, couldn't uh, contemplate. And again, no investigation into, an, uh, into any of my analysis. It was just these views on 9-11 are absolutely so outlandish that you can't even contemplate. You know? And it was clear that I had to be sacked because my beliefs were just incompatible. Uh, I said that under the employment regulations there were 11 allegations of discrimination but it all hinged on whether my beliefs were being protected or not. Then um, it came, the interesting one was this, Judge Rosnan, which was all about the beliefs 
And my main purpose at this hearing was to determine whether I held a protected belief or not. And there were, three, you know, there were various tests. So I went with the barrister at this stage to argue that my beliefs were religious and philosophical based on the New World Order. Not much, I never said anything about 9-11 or 7-7, even though actually that led to the stands. So this is the way that the legal team had taken me down. And in a way, it was an interesting um, episode in the courts uh, because I was asked to take out all analysis. So all the analysis I could have done on 9-11 and 7-7, the barrister didn't want it in because that's empirical data. That's not philosophical. That's your data analysis. You've got to prove that your beliefs are philosophical. Okay, so I tried to prove that my beliefs were philosophical, but it didn't get me very far. Because at the pre-hearing review, the judge's verdict <coughs> came out, you know, and basically uh, I, 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 my argument wasn't coherent. It, it failed on one of the limbs, which was the cogency test. So I failed. Um, now, he said that this, the, the judge was a bit unfair here because he, he had his own views and clearly he wasn't convinced. And it wasn't my job to convince him that I was right, just that my beliefs could be plausible. But he applied the test as to whether I was right or not. And, you know, felt as though I wasn't logical on 9-11. It was an utter disgrace, though, this, this hearing, really, because it bore no reflection, his, his, his judgment, as to what really happened in that meeting. You know, but he chose to pick out certain things and write them up in such a way that would have now taken a, a statement of fact and uh, you couldn't really challenge them. So I've underlined certain things that were, you know, were in the judgment. <coughs> Mr. Farrell's uh, philosophical beliefs in my judgment, they signally failed to meet any minimum standards of cogency or coherence. Indeed, applying any objectives, that they are absurd beliefs, albeit sincerely held. He even got all the information I was telling him. I've mentioned Peter Power and advisor consultants. He just echoed it back wrong. He said Philip Powell and Vista. So he wasn't really listening to me anyway. You know, it was a it was a stitch up right from the word go. He even talked about asked me about Lady Justice Hallett. Well, fine. But he, and he says that I arrived at that belief the first time in the hearing. Well, I would do, wouldn't I? Because that hearing came after I, I got dismissed, so I didn't feature that hearing in my analysis. But then I got slated for bringing when he asked a question on it. But, oh, you've only just thought of that, haven't you? Well, no, I just didn't bring it up because it wasn't relevant at the time I was dismissed. This is how they were playing it. I mean, you know, they were always going to fail me. And they talked about, you know, all the information that's out there, you know, he just completely dismissed and ridiculed. You know, so all, you can find all of this. I don't need to go through it in great detail, you know. There's so much information, but he was he was not accepting that there was any information out there of any note that would disprove. So again, he was just totally in denial in all his arguments. He wasn't entirely negative about me because he did say that you know I was okay, honesty and sharing out in the witness statement, right? But this was the interesting bit. I viewed all the evidence, and as an analyst, come to the conclusion that the evidence points in one direction and not another. That is actually what I did. So that is truthful, that. And Wilson's is an intelligent man, he, that might not be truthful, but he is prepared to admit that he might be wrong. And that is more or less the position I was in. So in a way, I knew it wasn't really religious philosophical beliefs that led to my understands, even though they were a feature of what I'd written up. So in the end, I didn't win. So therefore, the only option that was left was to go through an unfair dismissal, where you know, the chances, the judge said, are very lim limited. So I knew I was actually on a loser now, but I, I thought, what do I do? I kept quiet. Nobody in the truth movement knew any of this. I was in the hearing on my own or with a couple of friends. Nobody in the truth movement. But when this judgment came out, I had no money left and I thought, should I continue it or should I just throw in the towel and walk away from it? Well, I spoke to this guy, Tony Gosling, mainly because of his, he had similar Christian beliefs to mine and he gave me a bollocking. He said, you've got to do this, Tony. You've got to keep going. So he asked me on a radio interview and I bottled it. I didn't do it. But then I did go on uh, a, a Rich Planet interview and that went viral. And it went viral on the 8th of July, 2011, exactly a year to the date when I made the stands. 
And on that particular day, again, good synchronicity here, the Chief Constable of South Yorkshire Police announced his early retirement a year early on the 8th of July. Interesting. But then when that interview went, started to get me known within the truth movement, and I appealed on the philosophical beliefs to the appeal hearing, but the judge came back and said basically, look, it was your analysis that led you to make the stance, not your philosophical beliefs. So the judge was entitled to do whatever he felt entitled to do. So therefore that was simply dismissed without a hearing, which left me simply going towards the unfair dismissal where I had very little chance of uh, doing it. And I had now, <coughs> now all money and I was heading towards a three day hearing. I, I couldn't afford a barrister so I was heading towards that three day hearing on my own. Right? And uh, I was getting feedback from one person in the police and that was the chaplain. He was saying, boy you aren't half creating a ripple in that pub. A ripple in the pond the case because it had been to court was now being used by chief constables and they were sharing it and discussing it and this was all about the Freemasonic free stuff this wasn't really about too much about 9-11 or 7-7 it barely got a mention but it was creating quite a wave anyway at the unfair dismissal, dismissal hearing I was in a terrible position really um, on my own going into a three day hearing but I had by this time linked up with the Kent Freedom Movement and people from the 9-11 Keep Talking group who were originally fancying getting a bus up to Sheffield to support me at the Employment Tribunal. Well, it didn't quite happen that way. I got a few people come up, but I got two pretty good guys, really. Ian R. Crane, who's a geopolitical analyst and a, a human resource director previously in the oil business, and Dr. Rory Ridley Duff, who joined me um, the evening before the, the unfair dismissal to chew the cut over the case and they thought there's been no investigation at all on this so they they completely threw me and said let's fight on that ground you're not going to win on your other ground so they basically turned the whole thing on its head and argued something that I would never have imagined I could argue on uh, and Ian Cray bless him he had a dream that night that he was going to represent me so he asked me could he represent me in the morning he really did so I had he, somebody like a giant like Ian Crane as my barrister which was a blessing really and it was good um, witness statements uh, witnesses giving statements there was Hiller and there was Little Boy from the Police Authority and there was Head of Personnel uh, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't get the Director of Intelligence my boss and my other boss in the witness box otherwise I'd have had a chance because they would have had to lie to, you know, from, you know, under a question so on the morning of the hearing, Tony, I'll represent you, deal or no deal? Yeah, deal. And here's a, just a flavour of some of the things that were said. So here's the personnel officer of the police authority saying in a question to Ian, are you saying that any person holding these views, in other words, if you think 9-11 and 77 was an inside job, you work for the police, right? You wouldn't be able to work for them. And the personnel officer said, yeah, that's the case. So it's like crime fault now. You cannot think this. If you think this, and you let that know, irrespective of whether you need to make a stance on it, which I did, but just the thought of it means that you wouldn't be able to work for the police according to the personnel officer. <coughs> Are there any circumstances when you, the director of finance, would consider it appropriate to submit false or incomplete financial accounts? No. Came back the answer. So why do you ask Tony to complete an incomplete and false? Strategic Threat Assessment Account uh, is the answer. Right? Honesty and integrity. Does it apply to the nth degree? Yeah. So they're saying all the right things. But why then did they sack me for being honest and interacting to their own professional standards for honesty and integrity and refuse to give out misleading analysis? Little boy, my views are outlandish. Never any investigation. When he, so it, when he was chair, he just simply rubber stamped everything. Institutional denial, straight away. So the three judges at the tribunal, they dismissed the claim. They made a verdict within hours. SYP reacted reasonably in dismissing me. No longer any trust and confidence in me to perform my role. Uh, redeployment simply not practical. I was too vocal right, for them. I wasn't, they weren't going to quiet me. 
I think that's what they concluded. So they followed the correct procedure and they dismissed the lack of the investigation that we were claiming, which was a new thing that Ian Crane came up with, um, and ordered court costs to go against me. So all of a sudden I'm faced with look, looming at the judges, looking at the judges, and they're going to slap a nine grand, nine grand bill on me for their costs. But because I was virtually bankrupt, they, 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 they uh, only slapped one grand on me. Um, and basically what happened then is that well, let, let's uh, look at the mainstream media. They gave me a battering. Sheffield Star, the, the pub, uh, and, and the Sun, both gave me a character assassination. Uh, the Star, having spent interviews with me, and Ian Crane, uh, and asked Councillor Elias Khan, who walked out in utter disgust at the hearing, and went to the Star, and the Star said, put 600 words down for us, so he did. And then they never end with the story at all. So somewhere on high, the media gets blocked. It will not let anything like this get published. The only thing that did get published was a little bit of a character assassination from the son who came knocking at the door. And uh, I was uh, quite happy to let them in, even though they actually gave me a character assassination. Any publicity on this is better than no publicity. Uh, Rory Ridley Duff actually gave them a, a, a rebuke. Right. And then, really, it went a bit bizarre and, and viral in the truth movement. You know, so the story then started to get out. Some real truthers, the 9-11 truth movement, some of the Christian family. And that character on the left-hand side, uh, in the big photograph, David Pitcock, who's the founder member of the British Islamic Party, he's just put in a 256-page report to the Independence Com Police Complaint Commission um, on why he's upset by the fact that I've been dismissed and sh the police should take it as a complaint. But it goes into all the aspects of the New World Order and the monetary system and what's going on in our world, as well as actually you know, anchoring it in to my dismissal, because he was there at the hearing. Um, my chess friends. I'm just, th th there's something about chess. I've mentioned the grand chess board with Zabrini Brzezinski. Um, but I, I, I actually told all these chess players about this and not one of them, not one of them, and these are people who are by and large got a decent intellect, they can think, but they don't want to know, they are, they're not truthers, they are simply don't want to, and there were 64 in that, in that room who were emailed and I never got a reply out of anybody, having run that kind of tournament. Christian Church, that's an interesting one, they don't want to know. I'm a Christian, I've known, I've been in a very good Christian church. I know a lot of people in the Barnsley district who are Christians. Mention this. That disappoints, that saddens me. The minister came to you though, didn't he? Well, there was a minister who put the idea, it, it wasn't a minister in Barnsley, it was a minister in Sheffield who, who was shocked when I said 9 11 and he just said to me, have you, and I don't know whether he was aware of anything, he just said, have you checked out 7 7? And I thought, no, I'll check it out when I get home. But no, by and large, they, don't, they, they, they have not embraced this. Although I have had some good support, prayerful support, financial support <coughs> from individuals, but get, will they let me talk about my Christian faith and experiences? And my Christian experiences are quite remarkable in a, in a Christian setting and what I've stood for. No. And I'll point, you know, the same thing happened with this guy who's written 10 books. David Ray Griffin, Dr. David Ray Griffin, about 9-11, he's a theologian, he's written, you know, 9-11, 10 years later, Christian faith and the truth behind 9-11, he, he complains that in America they seem to have two faiths, they've got the Christian faith and they've got the nationalistic faith, and the nationalistic, even though they claim to have Christian faith, it's the nationalistic faith that's dominant, right? It doesn't seem to be in keeping with the teachings of Jesus who was in the Roman Empire and spoke out. Interesting. I feel let down, I feel appalled, I feel... But it, it doesn't diminish my own particular faith. It's just that I see a cowardice, a lukewarm about the faith. Where is the Christian leaders speaking out about what's happening in our country? 
I think I think I see that on a wider societal front. Yeah. I see. Yeah. You know, I'm an atheist, and I see yeah. exactly the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. The Muslims. Well, they're the actual people that were supposed to have done it. They tried to speak out. These particular guys, David Pidcock, Dr. Nassim from the Birmingham Mosque, and uh, somebody who's uh, paid a price as well, Keith Barrett in America, who's been. The anti-truth movement, people like Jamie Barrett at the bottom in the red, right, from Demos, going into schools now, teaching children how to use the internet to fend off criticism of the government. So you've been, the children in, in junior schools have been brainwashed and told how to use the internet to avoid getting too engrossed in what is compelling evidence against the government narrative. So they, are, they must be worried now, we must be doing something right. Because when he's doing that, well, these people, by their denials, I believe are complicit. That's a guy that's appeared in We Are Change uh, Leeds recently, Norman Scar, And he said something that I thought had resonance. He said in this country, he saw that 33% uh, people are cowardly, 33% people are asleep. 33% are just evil. And 1% are fighting for the truth. Now, whether he's got his statistics wrong, I don't know. But I guess that that has a lot of resonance in terms of what we are up against in the truth movement. Uh, I... I um, I don't want to go into this yet unless uh, until we've had a break, but where does the case, before I, 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 I like we go for a bit of a break, where is the case now? Well, I've lost the unfair dismissal, but I want to share a dream with you that I had six months ago in a slap bang in the middle of this, because I think it's very relevant, because I had a dream one morning, and the dream was this, and it was with T, the my boss, and my boss said, we're going to have to reinstate Tony because of Lord Atkin. I woke up at that point, so there's me winning the case because of Lord Atkin. Who's Lord Atkin? I haven't got a clue. So I, I thought he must be somebody in the House of Lords. I'd never heard of Lord Atkin before. So I googled Lord Atkin when I woke up that morning, believing that it would be somebody in the House of Lords. In actual fact, I found out that it was to do with a famous law case back in 1929, which is the snail in the bottle case, which is all about the duty of care, love thy neighbour principle. And I thought, well, that's interesting, because I honestly had never heard of Lord Atkin before. Now, I mentioned that to, the, to my legal team, who completely ignored it. It's not relevant. I thought, well, hey, I've had a few prophetic dreams here. And I could tell you about that in the final part if we want, but you know, some astonishing things are happening to me. I've had another dream that's going to win me the case, right? Well, it could be, you know, if, if, if some of these dreams come true, and a lot of them have done. So I said, look, check it out, but he didn't. Anyway, I lost the case, but I can appeal, and I've ditched my lawyers, right? And I've joined somebody who is in London. Um, who's been working on my case for nothing. She's not, she's not with her legal team. She works on her own. And she's a fighter in a, a lot of uh, cases that are high profile. And she's got hold of my case and turned it round. And she says, they've stitched you up. Right from the word go, they've sent you down the wrong line. They should have treated you, your, what you've done, as a protected disclosure. You were, in effect, the whistleblower. You were alleging criminality. They had a duty by their own standards to investigate what you were saying without fear of getting the threat of getting the sack. And it's all about the duty of care principle. You and, and, and at first when I had that dream, I remember thinking they had a duty of care. My employers had a duty of care to me. No, I had a duty of care to people out in the community, not to tell a lie where I saw threat. Now, we can appeal on those grounds, on the uh, 
uh, Public Interest Disclosure Act 1998, we can appeal. And um, they clearly haven't investigated anything that I've done by way of analysis, by their own admission what's already in court. So if, it's, if that is permitted to be amended, then my case is won. Also, if it's won, we are talking about potentially racial, uh, an element of racial discrimination. That they were, you know, they've sat me because I was refusing to be discriminatory to the likes of the Muslim population, right? Who I felt have been demonised, and we've got this ridiculous process, this dumbed down strategic threat risk assessment matrix that wouldn't pass, that wouldn't pass O-level mathematics in its methodology, right? That is deliberately being used to dumb us all down. You look at those threat levels that are issued by the government without any intelligence whatsoever. And that's to keep us all frightened. And it's to keep us all, you know, you look at what else is coming in, the legislation, the Inquiries Act that came in shortly after 2005, the Terrorism Act, right? All the surveillance in our state, right? It's a deliberate ploy. That the, I think that needs to be revealed and exposed for all it's worth. I hope that I do get a second bite at the cherry here with the case, because if I do, I think the case is technically won. Obviously, uh, that's going to be a big issue, but my appeal deadline is next week so I'm going down to the, the, the solicitor tomorrow to put the final skeleton argument together but it will allow me all being well all the analysis the analysis rather than the beliefs beliefs are now irrelevant the philosophical religious beliefs are not important I can now show the analysis that I would have present that I offered them three or four times and they refused to take on why as an analyst as a trained analyst Training in the techniques of inference development, why I was utterly convinced that 9 11 and 7 7 were inside jobs and that the threat wasn't from Islamic terrorism. It was from something completely different. It was something more sinister from within. And I can justify why I was able to say that through strategic intelligence analysis techniques. And that is what they are going to get as appendices to the skeleton argument when it comes to the next round. So I'm not down and out yet. I want to keep going and uh, I think that's a useful time now to have a bit of a break or have a drink uh, and we can discuss do we want to go on any more because I've got a few more things to show you but you know they are more about my, things that have happened to me and my religious beliefs and some astonishing things uh, so it may not be everybody's cup of tea but you can take a call on whether you want to see that or not okay so <coughs> is that a good time to break okay, thank you. Next, there's, there's two options basically. Uh, there's just having a simple question and answer session on what I've told you so far. I'm happy to do that. Or there is a, a there is some more slides and, and a story to tell, which is it, it's really about how I felt I've been spiritually called to do this. Now, if it came out with this straight away, you don't think I'm cranky. But hopefully by now you don't think I'm quite cranky. So. But it, it might not be everybody's cup of tea, and again, it might be, I don't know. So there's two options. I don't, I don't, you know, I've got Christian faith, so if you don't want to hear any of this, then I'm happy not to talk about it. But the tale I've got to tell, I believe, is quite astonishing. There's certain things that have happened that I find absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, and uh, I think there would be of interest, irrespective of what faith you are or whether you know faith. But that, I don't want to sort of put that out unless you go for it. Throw it out. Get it out. Could we have like both? Like, um, yeah, we'll have, then, yeah. Uh, uh, we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So I'll, I'll get on with this part, which is really me showing a bit of my soft underbelly. Uh, I call it, you know, a bit responding to the call is the first bit. Uh, right, I just put this in today. Where am I going uh, to, to pick off where I left off? The Public Interest Disclosure Act is where I'm going to take this case under the duty of care principle, which was coincided, coincided with the dream I had on Lord Atkins, right? And uh, South Yorkshire Police Authority was effectively demanding that I discriminate against the Islamic race, both locally and globally. And why did my legal team insist upon 
removing all my evidence on my previous court cases. They never mentioned any of that legislation and they should have done. So basically my own legal team stitched me up. So, responding to the court, I, I've told you the story, but there is another story to tell, which is the spiritual side of this. Uh, dreams. Ian Crane, those that some people, who knows Ian Crane here? Okay, so most of you do. He, he, as I say, he represented me as a, but he only represented me, decided to, because he had a dream the night before that he should represent me in court. Right. Dreams. Before I knew anything about the New World Order, before I had any problems at work, this was two years before I made the stance, I had an incredible dream. And that dream was a vicious police state tyranny that burst into my office at work. I was not in any confrontation at work. And uh, they burst in and opened machine guns, you know, armed to the kill, opened machine guns, and behind louvered doors, opened machine guns, and children were being massacred. And I was sat watching all of this. And then the window where I were, blew open, bright blue sky, gust of wind came in, and the, this voice came and said, Tony, this is Jesus, I want you to lay down your life for me, in which case I wake up. Not the kind of dream you normally have. And I'm thinking, what on earth is that? Now nothing, nothing at that time was actually causing me a problem at work. And I, knew, I had not looked at New World Order or anything, anything about police state tyranny. So I was thinking, what on earth is that about? So I assume, although I, you, know, you don't forget dreams like that, I never really give it another thought. Right? But it was, there in the, it, it was there in my memory. Right, so that's the dream I had. It was terrible. Now, I mentioned that Valley of Decision. On the 7th of July 2010, five years on, when I had that choice to make, do I stand up, make the stands, or do I prostitute myself and keep my job and tell a lie? That dream at that point was the tipping point for me. I've been, I've been asked to stand um, as a witness to police state tyranny two years earlier. This is my time now when I've been asked to make a stance. So, in a way, it was the dream that gave me the courage and the conviction that I must do this. So I did, basically. My faith was instrumental in that. I'd also had a dream that week which was about taking the cow, before, before really I, I knew I had to make the stance. I, was, I had a dream where rocks were coming at me on the pavement and they kept missing me but I was in danger and at, at the bottom was a taxi driver who asked me to go to safety up the yellow brick road. I woke up, I didn't take that yellow brick road but I, I wasn't hurt in the dream even though those rocks were just missing me, hundreds of them. That's South Yorkshire Police Headquarters. A recent dream I had, which was just before the Hillsborough thing kicked off, where that blew up in their faces, was I was on the fifth floor, bright blue sky, two exocet missiles, sorry, cruise missiles, multicoloured, come over in the horizon, and then suddenly head towards me, and at the last minute veer down into where the fourth floor is, Police Headquarters Senior Command Team, the third floor is, which is the CID management that sacked me. Boom. I got unharmed. They got smashed to smithereens, <laughs> explosives. Uh, a week later, the Hillsborough thing blew up in the faces. But there was two missiles, so I'm wondering what the other one is. Is it going to be my case, or is it something else that explodes in the face of South Yorkshire police? Um, personal experiences. I've mentioned chess as uh, one of my pastimes. Now, this is a true story. Um, I just put Brzezinski. Have anybody heard of it? Yeah. 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 Um, a political uh, giant, along, along the lines of Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, talked about the project for the new American <coughs> century and the set, really very influential in the American agenda, imperialistic agenda, well before 2000, uh, you know, 9/11. Ian's um, a fan, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the now, million people part, yeah, isn't it? Now, Bar I'm a chess player for Barnsley and they organise the Blitz chess tournament which all the best chess players across the county come and play once a year for charity in what is a prestigious event 
there's, there's the sort of thing. They're the best chess players in the county, all playing lightning chess, which is like a game lasts 10 minutes instead of sort of two hours. And it's a tournament I've organised. And basically, as uh, at the end of that tournament, this is what happened, it was bizarre. Because I was in the church hall, hosting the tournament, and as I spoke with the mic in, I said this, in the words of Vasily Tartikova, who's a chess master, in Blitz, it's always better to sacrifice your opponent's pieces than your own. And we used two words in that sentence that had spiritual connotations, immortality and sacrifice. As I said that, the microphone sort of, you know, sometimes it goes really loud. It did. There was a scream from out of the back. Is there a doctor in the house? A 51-year-old chess player, as I said it, just drop dead. And what's more, I mean, shocking as that incident was, that, that, that person, his last competitive game of chess, bear in mind there's about 400 chess players on the circuit, was a week before against me in the final decisive game of the season for the championship that was the last one to finish. There was also other coincidental things about that individual connected with me and my family but I won't go into detail, but why it should be him, why that split second time, as I said, sacrifice immortality, heaven only knows, but it was bizarre to say the least. <coughs> a week later, <coughs> yeah, so that, that's what happened, he dropped dead. First, you know, if you want proof, that's what happened, all the chess clubs reported on it, right? Connections with uh, my family and all sorts of dreams I'd had. But a week after, this is where we get to some interesting bit, because we're all in a state of shock. I'm in particular, I mean, as, a, as a captain of Barnsley Chess Club, as a steward in the church, I'd obviously wanted to go to his funeral and everything like that. But my appetite for chess for a while had been diminished. But I was reading the Bible, the Revelation, about the woman that rides the beast in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, which is all... You know, it, it's about some of the putridness throughout the ages in the Christian church. I won't mention the denomination. But I, I, I had a headache after reading it. So I put, the ch I put the Bible down and logged on to chess only. We all go by the pseudo names. I go by the name of Colonel 99. And the first name that pops up was a name I'd never seen before. And he's a player from New York called Jeremiah 33.3. So instead of actually accepting a game with him, I opened the Bible at Jeremiah 33.3 and what does it say? Call on to me and I will answer thee and show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now at this point in time I knew very, very little about the New World Order, the Freemasons, and certainly didn't know anything about 9 million seven, seven. But from, I kid you not, from about that point onwards was an avalanche of information that came my way that completely transformed my way of thinking. Um, and it happened that it, with such a concentrated and intense way, it was almost like 24/7 then, from the re leading up to the time I made the stands. That was in May the 10th. That was May the 10th, or sorry, May the 17th. I'd, look, I'd basically made me stand for badge in July, and at that point, I knew very little. I knew very little about the new world order, but it seemed like everything, everything I looked at was like oh, blinding. Right. So then. What I did, on the 8th of July, that's the date I make the stance. So, I know I'm going to go into work and basically do something. I'm going to commit professional career suicide. And I know that. And I'm waking up in the morning, what do I do? So, you know, I'm, I'm sweating. You know, this is it, Tony. You, you, you're either going to do it or you're going to bottle out. So, I just, for some reason, I remember that chest from two months ago. And I remember Jeremiah 33. So, I go on and type in 33. 3. YouTube, Jeremiah 33.3, thinking I'll get some kind of divine inspiration. The first thing that pops up was 9-11, the very thing I'm standing for. 9-11 in America, for those that don't know, is the secular call for help. If you ring that, it's like 999. Whereas Jeremiah is the call for help from God. What that did to me, you know, me personally, it was also, it was almost like confirmation. That, hey, look. Trust in the Lord rather than your own strength or in a man's strength. You're going to have to do something. But I called you to do this in that dream two years ago. Jeremiah, call unto me and I will answer thee 
and show thee great things and mighty things which thou knowest not. So secret things will start to be revealed to you. I'm going to show you another story now. This is again a true story, which is, I think is quite astonishing. Uh, it's to do with Luke 18 and the parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. And I mentioned on the 2nd of September, the day of my dismissal, Hillary is the judge, the director of finance. And on the direct, on that same day, well, it's all about in the word for today, honestly, in the workplace. There's also some synchronicity with Abraham Lincoln that have, have actually used, right? But that parable of the unjust judge came to me that week where I'm at the appeal hearing, where three separate occasions, I'd never heard of that parable before, but it was given me independently. That, you know, and the parable of the unjust judge. Right, it started off because I was doing a presentation and then when I went to a presentation, I went to Doncaster and that scripture was given me and the exposition of that scripture was this. This judge doesn't give a damn about, his, about fairness, justice. He's certainly not God fearing. And he, 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 the only thing he's ever interested in is his own reputation. But this widow wears him down because of prayer and she will not give in. She's got this grievance, we don't know what the grievance is, but she just keeps and she wears the judge down. And the exposition of that, ultimately, she, 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 the judge caves in because she's a nuisance. And not from any sense of justice, she gets justice. But that's the judge caving in. Now the exposition of that was all about, as it was given to me, God, it's an imagery of a boxing match basically, where God gives Satan a black eye. That was how the exposition of it was told to me. And again, three separate occasions, that scripture, of all the scriptures, came to me that week. And I was telling a bloke in the church about this one Wednesday, saying, how oh, about this, the week of my trial, I've had this scripture given to me, three independent times, and it's about this. Then something remarkable happened, because I get in the car, and within five minutes, I see quite an interesting accident. Right? I see at the crossroads a police car, I, I called the police, and there's a <laughs> massive, great big black 4x4 four four that's been shunted from driver's seat directly underneath a vacant Mason's Arms pub <laughs> hanging by or beneath the square of the compass, which is the sign from the, you know, the, the symbol from Freemasonry. What's more, as I rubber necked it, I looked at the number plate, and to my utter amazement, that number plate was nothing more than R666 six, 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 OWL. That was five minutes after they described this guy about the parable of the unjust judge, about God giving Satan a black eye. I thought, heavens above, that's interesting. You know, the interesting thing about the square and the compass is actually. Does anybody know what it really means in the Bible? What it stands for? Okay. Mason. Genesis chapter 6. Sons of God mingle with the daughters of men. Check it out for those that do uh, that, that uh, like the scripture. But a guy who will give you a good exposition of that is Professor Walter B. Um, but it's satanic. It's about, you know, Genesis 6, read it. <coughs> And the fallen angels come down and mingle with it. So there we have, like the the, the Freemasonic sign R66, God giving Satan a black eye, and that happens. Amazing coincidences. Here's another one though, because I'm telling Ian about that story I've just told you. After we've we've had our first day at work, uh, uh, you know, in, in the unfair um, dismissal, and I said, as I said to Ian that, and I mentioned, I said. And it's all six six out. He goes, I know the person. Now this is Barnsley. It's happening, right? He's never been to Barnsley in his life before when this accident occurs. He says, I know exactly who that person is. He says that person is the head of the Sony Society. He says, What's the Sony Society? I didn't know. He says it's to do with the Da Vinci Code and the bloodline of Mary Ma Jesus with Mary Magdalene, or that alleged bloodline. The priory, and it's to do with the priory of Zion. 
So, quite astonishing things, really, I think, in, the, in that sequence of actual events. But not just that, that location where that car was shunted, the 066 Black 4x4, underneath the square of the compass, three days before that happened, I'd had a crash. Because about 100 yards away from that was a bus stop with that sign on, the last exorcism. And as I was driving down, I eyeballed that. The next thing, there's a car coming straight at me. So I had to basically mount the curb, bust the tyre, and virtually scrape my car right on, the, <coughs> on the side of the bus just to try and avoid that. So some bizarre things were going on here. I mean, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was incredible. Now, a, few months, a month later, you know, this, a year later, the, the evening before Pe Pe Pentecost Sunday, right, I happened to be looking at this particular um, thing on the, on, the, on the bus. And in particular, you can just see, the, this here is, is, is a saw mark that's, you know, it's quite compelling evidence to show that th that bus was actually meant to actually lift its top off. And where that sort of frame is, it's clear that a hacksaw has been trying to saw it off. Again, obviously, uh, pointed towards being an inside job. So the day before Pentecost was when I was looking at that shape. And I, I drive past that Mason's Arms again. I've not been past there for a while. And it immediately reminds me, <laughs> in a funny kind of way, because the whole of the roof had been sliced off by this time. And, and, and this is two months later, and it's the first time I've driven past this area since. And I immediately say to myself, it just reminds me of the day before with, with the London bombings. And I said to myself, <coughs> that will be flattened to the ground the day I get the hearing through. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, about uh, a week later, that's what happened. The judge's verdict came out exact same day that that was flattened to the ground. Now, make of that what you will, that's a bit of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, talking uh, about some of my experiences. Uh, here's another one that is absolutely <coughs> bizarre. Minister's request for help. Would I, would I do the full immersion of a baptism in March 2010. Now, I had a, I had a, this wasn't a dream, and I'm not going schizophrenic, it's only ever happened once. But there has been one time in my life, not so, about the time I had that dream, about laying down your life, where I wasn't, that way, I wasn't asleep, but I heard a voice, and that voice was saying, Tony, this is Jesus, I want you to go to Slovakia. And I thought, uh, you know, I was not asleep. I was wide awake when that, where's that come from? So, when this guy asked me to do a baptism, he asked me to do a baptism with a chap who'd just come to church who actually worked in Slovakia. This was afterwards, you see. I thought, well, how can I refuse? If, if I've been told by an audible voice to go to Slovakia and I've been asked to do a baptism, not that I'd ever done one before, how could I refuse? So I agreed to it. And this is, this is unusual because yeah, that's the kind of baptism, that's, they're not the people, but that's the kind of full immersion I did. And later on that afternoon, I never wa hardly ever watched the telly, put the news on. And at the exact same time I put the news on, just for a cup of tea for that day, because I'd spend most of my time on the computer. So at a nanosecond, bear in mind I'd just baptised somebody, I baptised you with water here. That, I switched the television on in my kitchen, and that comes up, at that scene, which is a three hour epic film, on Easter Sunday, um, John the Baptist. And I'd just done the baptism, I, but I baptized my son in a nice little con. And he that will baptize, follow with fire. Now, if that wasn't interesting enough, the next day is Easter Monday. Again, I've been upstairs since about 7 o'clock in the morning, working on the computer. 2 o'clock in, <coughs> uh, in the afternoon, I come on and I switch the television on for the lunchtime news. Want to know if Hamilton's won the Grand Prix. That was from the King of Kings, by the way. As I put the television on in the kitchen, the same thing happens again. Well, it's Charlton Heston, again at the same scene in the River Jordan, baptizing, saying the same kind of words. And I'm thinking, what's happening here? This synchronicity is, is, is unreal. If that wasn't enough, that's twice. Right? Roll the clock forward, 
a year later, at Easter 2011, and clearly I'm not really, um, I'm, I'm looking out for this on Easter Sunday, and of course nothing happens, but a week after Easter Sunday, that same thing, this one, I, I, I'm up to <coughs> so the deja vu. This is like a week after Easter Sunday. I don't know what's on television. I switch the news on, on a Monday, and that same clip, is the first thing that appears on the television. So that's three times it's happened. And I'm thinking, oh, John the Baptist? What did he have to do? He, sp he, he spoke out. He spoke out against, you know, against Herod. Am I being told to speak out in some way? They were the kind of, that was the kind of discernment, no matter what the cost. If you want to know why I had the courage to do this, is when these things are happening, you think, you better sort of pay attention, if you've got faith. Uh, yeah. That was my thinking anyway. So where are, that leaves us, you know, I've just told you some <coughs> some, interest, well, uh, some experiences, I've showed me soft on the belly of my experiences as to what's led me to this, which is why I give some credence when I have a dream about Lord Atkin, the duty of care, love thy neighbour principle, and then when I go down to my solicitor last week and she says, without knowing that dream, she says, you should have had, you had a duty of care. The public disclosure, the public interest disclosure act, which is all about the duty of care, all about Lord Atkins' principle. And I can see, maybe I'm going to win this. You know, but there are so many circumstantial signs I've had, so many dreams I've had, that you know, I felt as though I've, I've received a calling to, to be where I am to do this. Not say, I'm not making any claims about being John the Baptist, don't mistake me. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not Ryan Dib saying that he's the Messiah. I am saying though, I've had circumstantial signs and dreams that seem to be guiding me to do this, be in a certain position at a certain time to make this stance and I am what I am. And it's why I can probably not be terribly frightened for speaking out the way I spoke out, you know, when normally people wouldn't want to speak out to senior police officers in the judicial system about Freemasons and the likes and satanic ideology. So that's where I am. Uh, at the moment, you know, there is an appeal, uh, a petition that's been set up and that uh, isn't going great volumes, but what it has done is it, it, it triggers off two complaints. It triggers one to the Employment Tribunal and one to the Independent Police Complaints Commission. And it's been good because David Pidcock, wrote 256 pages of the New World Order uh, as part of the petition that they're going to, the police complaints commission are going to have to consider. So if uh, www.change.org is my petition that Do Dr. Rory Ridley Duff set up. Now, do I want to be reinstated to the police? Well, I would go back if, they, if I won the case and they would accept me back. I'm not frightened of going back, even though it would be uncomfortable. And it, realistically, I can't imagine them wanting me back. I've said too much, basically. But nevertheless, I want to show them that I'm not afraid because I want to fight on. And I'd rather fight in a way I could do more good, I think, in the police service than outside in the truth room. However, that doesn't seem plausible. But I could end up winning the case. Um, and if it's win the case, if I win the case, then the case law becomes available. And therefore, it, you know, my analysis would be shown in court. Therefore, it's potentially problematic for the state, you know, to let my analysis get to that stage. But I'm determined to. So I'm not going to sell out. If it can, while ever I'm, I've got a means to carry on, I'll go to the bitter end. Uh, that's the calling for me, and that's that, you know. But obviously, it, you know, that's where I am, and it, I, you know, I'm in a precarious position. But I'm quite determined to see it through win or drop basically. Uh, there was an appeal fund set up and the only reason why I'm not bankrupt so far is that Ian Crane on the night on the, on 9 11 against interest when I lost that case on the unfair dismissal I had a, I had a, a, a five pound fifty job to start in the factory overnight that evening and instead of getting that job I, I decided to go down and uh, catch up with Ian Crane who was giving a talk and I'm glad I did because the next day it was on Edge TV on 9-11, the very day, 10 years to the day, and they set up the appeal fund that more than covered my initial court costs that they lumped on me two days earlier, and actually gave me enough money 
to, to get to the next stage. So around they, 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 they raised about four and a half thousand pounds, which has paid me legal costs and actually helped some of the costs that the overheads have got in order to at least get to the next stage where this is, uh, in, you know, in an interesting stage in the Employment Appeal Tribunal where the analysis could come out and it could be rather embarrassing if that happened. So uh, that's the situation um, that I've got. Matt Appeal, if you are interested in supporting it uh, or, or, you know, the petition, uh, you know, you, what you say will be in the face of the Police Complaints Commission and also the Employment Tribunal. I'd like to get to a thousand, there's about 400 people signed it so far, but by the time I'm in court it would be nice if I had four uh, thousand petitioners that I could use as proof to say, this isn't me just thinking this, a lot of people out there are now. And some of the, the, the beauty of this is that if you do feel like writing and getting in the noses of the Police Complaint Commission, this is an opportunity to, to possibly do that. So, it, you know, if if you feel strongly about the likes of 9-11 and 7-7 and the fact that I shouldn't have lost my job for making a stance against it, then consider signing the petition and possibly making a few comments as to why you signed that petition. Okay. Uh, I think, basically, that's the as much as I'd like to say now. Uh, I'm open to any questions. Um, I've obviously shown my soft underbelly there. If I'd have said that straight away, you'd have probably thought I'm loopy. I'm not loopy, but I've had these experiences and I am where I am. I'd recommend you, don't, I recommend you don't say any of that in front of the nine other skeptics. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 and I wouldn't normally. I, 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 t I took a litmus test here and I thought, you know, there's enough people that seem to want me to sort of talk about that. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, uh, and, and, and some people might sort of be put off by it, but I'm, I'm telling the truth as to what's happened. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, specific uh, experiences or facts you st struck upon um, during your work as an intelligence uh, analyst um, that got you into um, well um, masonic criticism. Because you mentioned like some outside cases, which would be 9/11 and 7/7, but you directly <coughs> from your work were there any things or experiences that not within no and. Um, in a way, I've learned a lot more outside the organisation than I ever learned. I, I, I was aware of um, inside it. Um, of all the officers, did, 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 did I know anybody that were Freemasons? I probably had a good guess that one or two of them were, but uh, I, I wasn't aware of any cases. There were, there were obviously some child abuse issues that you know were would in say Doncaster Social Services that were a bit suspicious but mm -hmm. I, I never got hands on you know uh, to, to those cases so uh, the, the, the answer to it is that I, I wasn't really aware of, of uh, Freemasonry within South Yorkshire Police except for one or two officers who used to sign their emails in a certain way by that I mean they'd have a, a logo on of a knight on yeah, the Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. and I thought, well, that is probably a Freemason or something of some sort. Uh, other than that, I was never asked to be a Freemason. Um, so, so, where did you find the logo, the Knights Templar logo? Where, where he, he put that on his personal email. Oh, he did. This okay. was a district commander, somebody okay. high up in the organisation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But well, I mean, when you look at the MI5 logo, for instance, that's very Masonic as well. So, I mean, yeah. it's not very. This is, isn't too big together. But. No. But what, what I was noticing. Uh, the, the, the problem was that I wasn't really alert to, 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 to masonry until right at the end. As I say, it all came flooding to me at the end. You know, so had I been alert, the, I mean, Rich Pitcher, for instance, the top, which is the, part of the contest strategy, uh, some of the documentation that they were putting out <coughs> was, was really trying to get, you know, uh, hotel owners, shopkeepers, all to sort of start looking and spying almost on your neighbours. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the, the part of the police's job was to permeate that message through to local authorities by introducing training programmes and selling the, the contest strategy that we would all have to embrace mm -hmm. right, in order to lessen the threat from terror. You see? So, now, now you, 
looking back now, I can see the telltale signs because the documentation was full of like the the one eye. You see, but at the time that would have been over. At the time when that was being used, that one eye had no meaning for me. Right? So, although it was staring in my face for long enough. I was blissfully unaware, I'm afraid. And I'm not proud of the fact that as a principal intelligence analyst, it took me till 2010 to become alert to the possibility that 9-11 was an inside job and 7-7 was an, in a way, I think, you know, it, it, it speaks something about the way we're trained. It speaks something. I wasn't particularly well clued up in my own, you know, it, it all came very late. What I will say is that now that I've come out, I've seen more, there's been a lot of people from the police who've come up to me and shook hands and said, well done, you're helping. You know, we know you're right with some of these beliefs and we know what's going on, but what do we do? Because uh, you know, these are, you know, there's good people in the police. You know, you we're know, realising I mean, what's going on. There's some very good people. Yeah, in the I mean, as far as symbolism goes, um, it's there in abundance. Uh, yeah. You know, even if you just watch it from a distance, um, it's, it's there. Yeah. In abundance, so. yeah. Once you're alert to it, but it, as I say, I wasn't alert to it. For most of my time, I was blind. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah quick question. Um, in relation to your <coughs> reinstatement, as it were, um, given that it seems, to, whether they mean to or not, it seems to be based on a, a corrupt, satanic system, as it were, mm -hmm. um, would you consider what if um, what if it got to the stage slash when it gets to the stage where the people can create their own uh, peace force, as it were, uh, peace officers who who would hold those corporate thugs who I call the police accountable to common law, for example? Yeah. Um, wouldn't you rather reinstate yourself to, to something like that? Well, yes. Uh I would, to be frank. Right. But uh, are we at a stage where that is going to happen just yet? I think so. Okay. You think we are? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the uh, the work the British consortium, uh, Roger Hayes, right. yeah. and, his, and, and that wonderful letter that's gone out. Um, the, uh, MPs have been uh, bombarded with, hopefully, now. Um, and I think it will frighten them. Um, at what point becomes the tipping point, and uh, you know, we do? It's just when we start to believe it, yeah. surely. Yeah, I don't. I mean, quite honestly, I don't think I'm going to get reinstated. I don't think there's a cat house chance of them. That I'm too much trouble. I mean, that's 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 kind of what I'm getting at. Do you think that? Do you think that? <coughs> is there more? E let's say you did. Let's say tomorrow you get reinstated and you get your job back. Do you think there's a greater back. chance of you changing things from the inside, or do you think there's a greater chance? things by becoming part of something that's trying to keep them in check? Um, I don't know. The honest, the honest answer to that, you can't really tell because um, I'm not frightened of going back and facing them and looking them in the eye right? and uh, confronting them on all of this. And, and, and therefore, because I've lost that fear, I feel as though I could do, I could do a job and not compromise myself. I may end up getting the sack again or whatever, but I'm not going to back down. It's kind of what I'm saying, following yeah. what you think is right. Well, Ephesians 6, the, the, the scripture I've used, it's all about you know, a spiritual warfare and that you're not supposed to turn your back on the devil. You're supposed to confront it. Right? And that's the way you defeat evil. So rather than walk away from it, I'd go in there and just confront it. Um, now, is it, would that be better? I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy out, uh, but I feel a calling to fight this case to the bitter end, win or lose, even drop. And who knows? I might have to. I might have to drop. If I drop, then some good might come of it anyway. It's just from my perspective that people are starting to think, "Hey, we can't trust. We can't trust them anymore. They no, work for the right. corporation. Yeah. They, don't, they don't work for the people. Even if they swore an oath to the people, yeah. they don't work for the people." Yeah. Therefore, we need something that holds them accountable to the people. Yeah. And 
that's why I asked the question. Yeah, I think if you went back, you'd be sidelined anyway. So, you know yeah. what I mean? It'd be a. Yeah. Over there you go. So, yeah. I think the most valuable thing you've provided, more to, to, to me and to, every, to the truth movement as a whole, is, is a conception of how senior police see us. Because you've, you've been discussed, you've, you've, had a, you've had discussions with the director of finance and yeah. uh, the people that sat to you. And they come back to you with conscious, active statements like, we will never get them to admit mm -hmm. the, the truth on this matter. Yeah. So it, it's a case of you're an eyewitness to statements by police members that know that massive crimes have been committed mm -hmm. and are nevertheless silent about it. So you're you're the first inside glimpse of law enforcement in Britain yeah. and how it fits into the global tyranny. It's quite interesting, isn't it? Because police officers, they wouldn't, you know, they, they tend to be quite brave in one sense. In other words, you're a big chap, but most police officers who wouldn't be as big as you would, would, would bring you down or would, would, wouldn't cower away in a fight against you. Well, they're brave, they're brave but, what you were, but were they cowardly? Were they cowardly? Is They will not stand up to their superior officers on issues like this. So while they're physically brave, if they want to have to put, do something that makes a stance and put the job on the line, they're cowardly, mostly. There's not too many that would be prepared to come out, at least not yet anyway. Let, let's hope that changes, because I think, you know, I do they are getting, they get turned over, or they, they start to heal from within. Well, this is it, I mean, you know, I, I don't know what, I, I don't, I don't have a crystal my, ball. In my view, the void now, it's just void. Yeah. It's just it's void, it's they're absolutely corruption. void. Their courts are void, mm -hmm. they are void, the, the organisation, the police, you know, policy, well, enforcement you, officers, you, it's void, it's just void, Abs all of it is just void. So therefore, you know, how do we hold these people accountable? And the problem is that as soon as we start to talk with testicles, shall we say, um, they'll be all too quick to go <gasps> domestic terrorists or something like that, you know. And and that's not what we that's not where we're coming from. We just want to hold these people accountable. Uh, from from my stance, I want to hold them accountable to common law, you know. Um, are, you, are they causing harm, loss, or fraud? Yes, they are. And as you said, going back to the Bible, all men are equal. All of man, that includes women, are equal. So, so in, in what sense are any of these judges or police officers or anything superior to us? And they seem to have this mentality because they have a, a uniform that, that they're superior in some way. Yeah. And it's just, it's a, it's a fallacy. It's an illusion. They're falling mm -hmm. for an absolute illusion. Yeah. So... We have to develop something ourselves, and that's why I re refer to some kind of people's private peace force. And it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we, we, we all want to be, we all, it, it, we probably all want to be like off the grid and everything. But even if you make your ideal off the grid, self-sufficient community where everyone's happy and, and having a great time, that community is going to need to defend itself. Um, so. How do we do that without stormtroopers banging on the doors? And uh, you know, how do we live just peacefully with, without without that harassment? You know, um, I'm personally I'm hoping that maybe some people, such as yourself, may think, "Hang on, maybe we'll be part of that team instead of this satanic team." That's kind of what I'm getting at. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, I can see that, and uh, I'm happy being out. You know the police at the moment, and I look back with great sadness uh, as to what's happening. But uh, I've not given up hope that the police are not potentially capable, at some stage in the future, of starting from healing from within. Uh, it's not everybody in the police is a Freemason. Not everybody in the police is dishonest. They still right. follow orders, though, don't they? Yeah, but for how long? I think the police will be in turmoil over the issues that are going on in our nation at the moment and that the, what we need to do is wake up as many police officers as soon peacefully as, as I've tried doing happened. that, I got arrested for a section 5 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and there'll be man, there'll with be all due respect I, I absolutely can, yeah, I can fully accept that yeah. there will be there will be evil and that people will, like Mohan did, for standing for the truth, will get thrown in prison. And it will take a few 
sort of martyrs, so to speak, that do get thrown in prison, or do get beaten up. But ultimately, I think, you know, what hope is there? You know, because the, the alternative is a civil war. I'd like to think that, you know, that the police and the politicians, at some stage, start to cleanse themselves. You know, yes, some, some are, are brought to justice. I, I, I think What's we need the our own. For doing I think that? we. Well, I think we need our own courts. We need our own bailiffs. We need our own peace officers, and we need to grab these people and hold yeah. them accountable to our common law. Yeah. Well, obviously, leaders are going to have to emerge within the truth movement to to, to enable that to happen. Yeah. Leaders do just need yeah. common. We need, we need people, people with testicles. We need people yeah. to stop talking and start doing <laughs> yeah. this. What we start well, you need doing. masses as well. You need a people power. Right? And the, I started this conversation this evening uh, because I witnessed something quite interesting, which was the power of the, the Liverpool people that have persisted over justice on Hillsborough. And I saw a change, a wind of change in the politicians. Now, word of that was just playing up to the gallery, but they were talking for the change of all the right rhetoric. Now. You know, they would, wouldn't they? But nevertheless, there was something in that evening that I thought, well, uh, well, I'll tell you what I did because at the end of that meeting, a guy called an MP from Southport, is it, um, an Everton supporter, Alan Andy Burnham, who was fr one of the, at the front bench on the Labour side, who was there on that evening, was was outside at eleven o'clock at night at Westminster, and I walked past him, and. Uh, they were obviously feeling good about themselves because of the quality of the debate that had been had in the Commons. And he was walking with somebody else I did not know who. And I was on my own and I walked past him. And I said to him, justice for 96 will be, is all well and good. What will be next will be justice for the 56 and the London bombers. I says, and that will test your <laughs> <laughs> I thought, where'd that, I thought well, where'd that come from? But I did actually, you know, I barked it out of him, you know, because he was walking past looking smug, they, as they would, having had a quality debate about the truth, about getting to the issues on Hillsborough, as a result of 140 odd thousand people signing a petition. What we need is obviously to wake up the masses and, and get that kind of people power. <coughs> And that was 140,000 on a petition for Hillsborough. Yeah. Yeah. Just going back to 7-7 seven, seven and the things surrounding it, Tommy. How do you think the um, Charles de Mendes uh, shooting fits into the picture? I don't know for sure of the direct connection, if any, with with the London bombers. Uh, I spoke to Nick Collistrum, who probably has got more insight than anybody and done more research other than perhaps you know, some members of the J Truth movement. I, I think th there is YouTube evidence that he was actually, you know, the way he was followed by this, you know, down the escalator, and then, you know, the way he was shot, you know, wasn't typical of, you know, how you would actually shoot somebody uh, that had a, an explosion, you know, a backpack explosion that was about to blow up. So uh, obviously he knew they had to, they, they, they were willing, ready, and able to take him out for whatever reason. And I've heard theories that he was an electrician that could have known something about the the uh, explosives that went on the underground and came from beneath the carriages. So I've heard that. Now that's not evidence. Um, what weight do we give it uh, in terms of directly linked to Seven Seven? I don't give it too much work weight necessarily but it is just an example of institutional denial in the way they've actually covered up what they've done uh, and the chart the subsequent you know way they treated it <coughs> that he was just an innocent victim rather than people were brought you know the, the intelligence security services that nobbled him uh, were allowed scot free to go away no questions asked and all public don't make an outcry of it Unfortunately, the family, I think, were bought off, ultimately, by stacks of money, um, which doesn't really help the cause. But it is, isn't it? it is a ter terrible example. Um, but there are more obvious you know, miscarriages of justice, I think, associated with 7-7. Um, 
you know, the Moad Dib and his, um, his imprisonment for 151 days, uh, I think is definitely linked with 7-7 and their need to keep the, 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 tr the truth hidden. And Hamid Mohammed um, is another case where it's just ridiculous. So there are, you know, the, if you look at it and you, you look at the false flag operations, the, you know, where is the terror threat from Islamic terrorism? It doesn't seem, it seems to be non-existent. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to really know if there is an authentic bollocks, incident. Bollocks springs to mind. And it's just demonising our Muslim population. Um, and what, what, what frightens me is that, you know, we haven't got enough brave Muslims standing up and speaking out. I can understand why. But we need, from all fates and none, to stand out against this. Wasn't it also a message that, at the end of the day, if they, it, if they suspect us, then they can shoot us dead if they want to? Wasn't it also just a message, just as simple as that? Just, just you know, hey, he's running away from us, therefore we can shoot him X number of times. David, David Kelly as well. I mean, you know, there's plenty of examples. Yeah. yeah, it's just a, it's a message, isn't it? Just yeah. Well, that's that's again about you know, like you said, we need a mass. I mean, one thing that spooks me of the seven, on talking about seven seven is, um, and I don't know, how many watched uh, Tom Secker's films? Secker. Tom Secker, Seeds of Deconstruction, and his latest film is Crime and Prejudice, which is about one hour and fifty four minutes. Now, in, the insight he's got is absolutely fantastic, absolutely fantastic. At every corner, every turn, he exposes the government, in a way, for, for the lies. And he comes up with a, a range of hypotheses. But he says things like mo what Moad did done is most unhelpful to the truth movement, which I, dis I, I dispute. And, and what Tom Secker does is, is talk about you know, all the things, that, all the possible ways and motives for why, for what happened, happened, without ever, without ever coming off the fence and saying, I think it was that one as opposed to that theory. And he says, all this is doing is clamouring for a, an, in, you know, an inquiry, an independent inquiry, as a result of showing lies in the government without actually pointing the finger at anybody in the government or anybody in the intelligence services. So, it, you know, you almost think, well, what is his role in all of this? Cause, because is it going to get... Is it going to get us anywhere? I mean, ten years on from 9/11, and we're still no nearer for them actually getting the truth accepted. Are we in that same position in 7/7 that in five years' time we'll all be saying 7/7's seven an inside job, isn't it? But we've never actually got to the truth, and we've never actually put out anyone bang to rights over it. And at some stage, the public have got to say, point the finger, on the basis of the weight of evidence. You know, rather than try and trust any independent inquiry well, that said, they'll ultimately have control of. Isn't that a per exactly, isn't, isn't, isn't that a personal choice in itself? Like, I've just told you my choice. They're void. <laughs> right? <laughs> They're just oh, void. Well, it's a very pessimistic, <laughs> right? you know, it's pessimistic. It's not really, I'm actually but optimistic you're, you're about everything well, that's outside yeah, their system. Yeah, it's a, yeah but I, I, I fully understand where you're coming from. You, yeah. A lot of people spend so many time, so much so many hours each week working and so many hours each week looking after the kids, doing all the basics of just having a life. But they actually don't think politically in any sense at all. They don't think anything beyond their immediate their immediate range. Do we I, I, I mean I, I, I assert that those people should be seen as human cattle. Do you agree that they should be disregarded? Because there comes a point where people have such horrific oppression in their faces. The Iraq War is the most obvious. <coughs> the Iraq War is so such an obvious act of tyranny and oppression and murder that people who don't stand against it, the people who weren't at the weren't at the protests, for example, in London, uh, are actually more or less complicit in it. Because of course, when they work and they work in the economy, they're part of the economy. When's the point? Where you would say, I, I, I already say to myself that these people are to be disregarded, that I don't consider them, I hardly consider them human anymore. Um, would, when is the point where you would disregard people on the grounds of excessive ignorance and complicity? Well, disregarding what sense, because can they be effective within the truth movement? Well, Ultimately, there comes a point, a tipping point, where people suddenly wake up. And the fact that, despite the bleeding, what might be bleeding obvious to us, 
some people are either cowardly or still asleep. I'm not in ever sort of of a mind to... I'm not talking about the cowardly ones here so much. I'm talking about the ones that are so busy with day-to-day, day-to-day but they reality. Can, the ones that, that know that that's what's going on, but <coughs> choose to do nothing to, about to, it. By that, yeah. they do? No, no, no. The no means the ones that but are cowards. But, but, but these, the the these, the these, these people can be flimsy, can't they, and go with the wind. So if there's a momentum game within the food movement, you're going to get... You're going to get them. That works for the cowards as well, because yeah. it works not yeah. only for the sheep. Yeah. And it works with the people. Well, it works I'm sure with you the should categorise people like that all the time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't want to be too I disagree. Call them sheep. Uh, yeah. well, call I, a spade I, I, a spade. Me, me also. Me <laughs> also. Why don't you just call them human beings? Because that's what they are. Because, yeah, you're right. Because human. No, sorry, human. Human beings are superstars. Above somebody because you have information that they don't. Can some can someone really go through life thinking that the only thing that they that they need to do with their life is feed themselves and feed their children? Can I think someone really just think that? Life that well, well if they're going to do that, then there are consequences. But those bad guys only have that power because of those people. Those That's the whole thing. People in control, in control of education, in control of what goes on in society, they've created these people, but that doesn't mean those people have any less value than anybody else. I, I, I don't have any brilliant education. I'm not saying I'm not saying that you have to have a brilliant oh, education. I, d I don't have any brilliant job. I, I, did, I didn't mention, I, 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 I actually made specifically clear, I said that somebody who is so busy and, over, and, and, and uh, engaged with menial day-to-day -day triviality that they don't think on any political level at any point <coughs> at all, Okay, so yeah. so what I'm saying is that these people have have voluntarily given up any any power that they have to think in any sense beyond their immediate tiny world. And as a result, whatever is going on in the system, they will continue to they will continue to support the system no matter how bad its crimes. And now its crimes have got to the point where there are millions of people dying as a result of the system. And these people are actively supporting it because they don't even spend one tenth of their time thinking politically. Not even, not even one hundredth of their time in being political. I'm pointing to these people and I'm saying they're actively dangerous beyond their, beyond their, in fact, because of their lack of cognizance. Okay, so I think that people who are actively dangerous in that sense <coughs> should be looked upon as a threat to the rest of humanity. And when someone's a threat to the rest of humanity, that is not necessarily someone who is less valuable, but somebody who is, who should be recognised as a threat and, and, and not considered as important in terms of their, the value of their opinion. You'll hear these people being extremely submissive in their analysis. Their analysis is always, well, you can't do anything about it. That's the first thing they'll say in response to. And when they do get spare time, all they're bothered about is who wins, come dance with X Factor absolutely, absolutely. in the jungle or whatever. Yeah. So, so, I mean, there comes <laughs> that's a point. Just, that's just being pumped that's, in their face, that's all they... Like, it's pumped in our face as well, but we say no, don't we? We choose to turn that television off. Yeah, yeah, I, I did, but I, you see, I feel for these people, because I'm from the same roots as these <coughs> people, my, I don't have, I don't even have a GCSE. I left for school at 15 and had a baby in 1979. It just, a lot of us are. A lot of us are. It just pieces of paper. That. My daughter, who was the baby I left school for to have, has now got a degree at Manchester University in um, linguistics and English. Now, when I sit and talk to her about stuff, she says, Oh, there's nothing to do about it. Well, I can't do anything about it. And she does live her life trying to. Uh, bring up her family, do a job. She doesn't have, she doesn't really have a lot of time to herself. I don't think she watches, watches X Factor and stuff like that. But generally, people are, are taught in this society, well, you can't do anything about it, so don't, don't get involved. But I don't think you can devalue these people. I think, I think it's a duty for people that do have knowledge to look at a way to educate people without putting yourself above them. Because, I mean, I, I, years ago... I, Haven't we all tried that, yeah, though? Has almost so, everyone in this room yeah, been accused well, of being yes, mad yeah, 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 for yeah, trying yeah, to explain yeah, that exactly. to them? It's like something you either wake up to or you don't. It's like something <coughs> that just comes to you in a day.
and you're just like, oh, I understand now. Mm. It's something that quick. Mm. I can't Ironic, say, I, would, I wouldn't say somebody that's, somebody that's really educated in mathematics or English or anything and they've got diplomas and A-levels and, and all that, that, that's not, that means absolutely nothing. That doesn't mean they've woke up, that just means that in society terms they look better than the next person does, like the homeless person on the street corner that probably knows more spiritually than what a lot of us know and he lives on the street corner with no money or anything. It's like everybody seems to uh, put, you know, how much money somebody owns or how many qualifications they have. People seem to say that's how powerful they are. It doesn't. That's a completely different thing. That doesn't mean they're powerful or they understand anything about life just because they have them things that uh, society and the government say they have qualifications, etc. Ironically, I think we're at the point where people like us need to be educating those people. And yeah, we've that all, would make a lot more sense. It would. We've all had the case. Uh, where I think you just said there, Tim, where we're the mad ones. Mm. And I get it within my own family. And when I was at AV3 in Bristol, um, the Alternative View seminar, that's what everybody there said. It's nice not to be the mad one in the family. Yes. It's nice to just be able to converse with people without having that, you know, attack or barrier up or what have you, just be able to talk openly. And uh, I think we are at this point, but there is an element of going sheeple, this, that, the other, or just going down, 11 was an inside job. They just think we're crazy, you know what I mean? If you're trying to educate someone, you have to take it back to the very start, show them how you were enlightened, what woke you up to it, and take slow, small steps and educate them. See, I think we're past that. I think we're past that. I think now we've got to lead by example. I think, now it's, I think now it's beyond waking up the sheeple. I think now it's a case of putting something together that works. And then when they see that our community works, mm and works fairer and more justly than that other system, then they'll get on board. I completely agree with what you know, you're saying and that's... I think, the, I think the time for waking up yeah. the sheeple is gone. I but think it's we try that? Because I don't think we did. That's in, the point I in 2004, I woke up to 9-11 Truth. In 2005, I opened an ch internet chat room on a, on, in a 7 million strong community mm. that was approximately 1% truther at that time. Okay. Right. This internet chat room filled up in about three hours. It was called, did, uh, did the US government do 7-7 like they did 9-11? Obviously, a third of the people in that room wanted to shut the room down immediately on the grounds that it was an offensive time. Okay? <laughs> by, by the end of that, <laughs> at, at the beginning there was maybe one 9-11 truth room in the, in, the whole, in the whole political section in this, online, in this online 7 million strong community. By the end of it, by the end of that month, that occurred there, there was about three chat rooms, and now truth of chat rooms are evenly balanced with li liberal chat rooms and conservative chat rooms. And through those rooms, me and about five other people who work with me online have reached approximately 300,000 people. That's probably everybody on the planet within about four degrees, within about two degrees of freedom, if you know what I mean by yeah. two degrees of freedom. So we have most definitely done that. And we still meet people who, who, in the phrase of the Matrix thing, uh, who are so <coughs> dependent on the system, they will defend it no matter how absurd the defences become. People who you will show melted steel, picture, pictures and mass spectroscopy of, and they will simply refuse to look at the document, even if it's on the FEMA website, because that's where one of the, one of the, one of the pieces of evidence are. There are people who are absolutely dependent on the system and submissive to the system and they don't care how bad it, how bad the evidence is against the system and how bad the crimes are, they will still go along with the man who pays them. Yeah. Okay? And those people, I consider them to be a danger to the rest of humanity. As you say, going to Tony there, going back to waking up, uh, I have a site called The Waking People, and you say about the 333, we actually have a thread in there, don't we? Mm -hmm. And Martin as well, and the amount of people you say about waking up, who have seen numbers, P3, P3, synchronicity, mm -hmm. the amount of people that are coming through the coast that keep seeing that, that set of numbers, so that's that's thrown us tonight with you saying that as well. So yeah. And I will I, be and I will be buying myself a Bible <laughs> and I will be reading Jeremiah <laughs> 333. Three, three. Well and it's I'm also it. it's also thirty three point three degrees of the pyramids as well, isn't it? So, so the question is Tony, yeah. how far does people have to go into economic submission and ignorance of the crimes? Before we say that they are actually criminal for their for their extreme negligence, 
I, I take the view, and it's only me personally, that we should not be too judgmental ourselves. Um, that's not to shirk away from bringing those criminals who've committed monstrous, monstrous crimes. They should be brought to rights and justice. Uh, but our, our friends or loved ones or whatever who've, who are not awake to this, who've turned a blind eye in spite of what we've said, um, who, who, who may not wake up immediately, I don't think we should be too judgmental. Uh, you know, I draw the line where they've actually committed criminal offences, but I don't take um, being passive on this or, or just bedding your head in the sand deliberately as something that I feel I, I, sh I should be judging. I think you know, each to his own as to what they they do uh, with this situation. Uh, we've all got consciences. Uh, let somebody else, let their maker be their judge, um, is what I say. But obviously we go after the criminals, the real criminals who killed and murdered, um, <coughs> who were in positions of authority. They need to be brought to justice. That's my own you know, philosophy, philosophy on this. So, you, you, meant, you quoted Norm Scarf in your, in your speech. What do you think of South Yorkshire police with regards to their handling of this case? It's, 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 it's essentially West Yorkshire police. Oh, is it? Yeah. So I, I'm not. I haven't got the detailed intelligence, but I think no. You know, I've got a lot of respect and admiration for for Norman. Uh, I think it's appalling how he has been treated by West Yorkshire police, from what I've seen. Uh, have I studied his case in any depth to be in an informed position to say much more than that? No. Okay, tell me about the, the honey trap. Tell me about the honey trap. Think of red that. Yeah, yeah, about the honey trap. Yeah. I'll be the honey trap. Well, whatever. The little girl trap. Whatever. <laughs> well, it was a honey trap of sorts, wasn't it? Um, yeah. I don't know. Does, do people want to hear? Does, are people aware? No, I'm not aware. But no, Norman, Norman Scarf, just for a bullet point version, is an 86-year-old now World War II veteran <coughs> who was uh, serving six months for audio recording in a court uh, up until quite recently. He was released on the 9th of September. And um, the recent hearing he had on the 17th, the next one's the 12th of January, so there's a date for your diaries. Um, but one on the 17th, how, how they uh, lured him to that. They knocked on it, he lives in sheltered housing in, in uh, Bradford. And they knocked on, a uh, young girl knocked on his door and said to Norman, uh, her grandmother was moved into the flat nearby, could he help with the fridge? Uh, it wasn't moving the fridge, it was something to do with it, it wasn't quite working. Norman, being the kind of man he is, just threw on a coat and shoes or what have you and went to this flat where when he got into the room, four police uh, manhandled him, put him in the cuffs and uh, took him down to the police station. So it was effectively a honey trap. Um, and basically if, you, if you're researching when you go home and if anyone wants to uh, join us on the 12th of January, any support would be greatly received. I still think you shouldn't go because those courts are void. I, I do appreciate your sentiment. <laughs> Tony, can I just... Uh run something by you, to get your opinion on it, because there is a sort of uh, this broad church within We Are Change Manchester on 7-7 and 9-11. Mm -hmm. I've got a, a, a feeling that 9-11 um, and 7-7 were uh, committed the way they were because eventually they have to be found out as being inside jobs because they want to suspend democracy in America and places like Britain. So that they can introduce martial law and get the final. Have you got any feelings on that? Why it's why it's, it's so easy to, for people like us to see that it's an inside job? It's because they meant it to be like that. In plain sight. In plain sight. I think that, that there is a distinct possibility. I would say that that's that it, that's deliberately the way it's meant to be. These people are very, very, very clever. Who are who have organ orchestrated this. Uh, in the intelligence services, and, and there's an awful lot of spooky things that are happening that um, you know, are deliberately seeming to want to pit one group against another Christians against Muslims, truthers against non truthers. You know, you look at what happened in the riots, you know, and uh, you know, it, it was almost like the government wanted that to happen and may well have been a catalyst. 
with agent provocateurs in some instances to deliberately do that in order to get the middle classes instead of looking at them start looking at the working classes and the underclass and starting pointing finger at the wrong people uh, so it's all very very clever um, but I also feel you look at well, one study that is interesting is the occult on all of this and it's amazing how uh, how, how the occult numerology in these things uh, occurs um, so it's almost like an evil force, evil power, a satanic power that has got ultimate control and ruling the earth at the moment, yeah. at this global effect, because you know, there is so much information that is astonishing in terms of how all the occult numerology seems to happen uh, and these events. It, you know, it, it's almost beyond the, the human intellect to actually make it happen like this way, that it's something supernatural. Is, you know, and obviously the Bible says that in the end times this is the exact thing that will happen, that the, you know, the devil will rule the world until well, the second coming. Can I just add something to that? I mean, it's my theory at least, I don't know whether you agree, but I think we're supposed to find all this out in order that we all revolt, in order that we actually beg for this new system. Uh, you've seen them all already at Occupy Wall Street, <coughs> begging for global governance by the people, for the people. It still has global governance in inverted commas, right? Um, and it seems to me, uh, especially with the, the withholding various um, technologies, um, and uh, it seems to me anyway that these Rothschilds, the Illuminati, call them what you want, are going to offer us some kind of quote unquote utopia with free energy, cures to cancer, this, that, the other, so we'll all think it's absolutely perfect. But it's satanic, mm. it's born on the blood of innocence. Mm. And that's what they're doing. In, in my opinion, it's, it's all about. And you can see it. I can see it already. I can see. I can see a lot of Occupy. I know there's a, a number of different factions within Occupy and different schools of thought. But it seems to me, especially the way in which they're trying to push it within the media, anyway, is that it's some kind of leftist point of view. Mm -hmm. I.e., they want us to beg. They want the people to beg for a communist new world order. Um, uh, well, and it will still fit within democracy, but in my view, democracy is a bit dubious as well. I mean, in democracy, the 51% can force the 49% to do whatever they want. That's not freedom, in my view. Uh, in my view, we're all kings and queens, and we're all sovereign, and we all need to respect each other for that. Um, so, I guess I can digress, and I could go on about this for a long time, but it's, it's my opinion that all this is happening in order that we do figure it out, in order that we rebel against it, in order that they offer us a solution, and that solution is this utopia, which is satanically inspired. That's what I reckon. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. <laughs> Fair point, well made. All right, thank you. <laughs> I'll sit then, guys. Right. Okay. Thanks very much, Tom. <laughs>